It is spooky season, Halloween is right around the corner. I hope you're very much looking forward to some horror films in which a variety of characters meet a series of extremely unpleasant fates, but uh, what if this time we took it up a level? What if this time you watched a whole movie be torn apart, just absolutely eviscerated? Scream 6 was released in March 2023. I say released, although came out feels somewhat more apt, but I, I digress. We've had over seven months from the time of recording to look at this film, and so I'm not gonna give you a cheap bit of fare. I, I'm not gonna give you the typical low effort, low attention span, low cut top video. That is sadly most of horror YouTube these days. No, this is time for a deep dive. It's time to be thorough. It's time to be maybe pedantic, or you might even say a little bit long. And I think I'm very much the person to do this. I have been a Scream fan, maybe even a little cringily over-invested, all the way since 1997 when I rented the original on VHS. I love this series. I have been following this crew, this cast of characters since then, and what an amazing time, what a family. How did the years go by it? Now it's only me. And I am not gonna be wasting your time in this deep dive, no. I'm not gonna be focusing on cheap bits of sloppiness like, say, characters dying silently when it's convenient for the film, or or Quinn, the sexually liberated roommate, going from a full-on slatternly schlorping session in her bedroom to being out and dressed and fully de in about two seconds flat, which is kind of a record, or this character wearing a white top being splashed in what is nominally, we are told, Diet Cherry Coke, and yet it leaves no dark stain. Absolutely ridiculous. No, I, I'm not even going to mention that stuff. This isn't Cinema Sins. This is going to be serious analysis. This is going to be considered. And I'm going to be doing it because Scream 6 is not just a terrible movie. Who cares about that? It's a wasted opportunity and it's an insult to a franchise that I care about. So I'm going all in on this one. I hope you enjoy it. I've broken it down into six problems, six thematic areas, and those are going to be in chapters. I'm going to release some individually. And if you came in from one of those segments, please do feel free to make use of the chapters function to skip around, skip over things you've seen already. That's absolutely fine. But I am asking you, do watch the whole thing. Take it all in, get the full understanding of why Scream 6 fails so hard. And naturally, because so much work went into this, please do show some appreciation, you know, liking, subscribing if you haven't subscribed already, there are membership options, all that good stuff. Also, a special request, if you know someone who would appreciate this kind of more serious horror analysis, this deeper analysis, please do send the video to them. And if you know someone who liked Scream 6, who thought it was good, definitely send it to them. You know, uh, spoil their afternoon, make them feel stupid, sour the friendship, I would really appreciate it, thank you. That is, that is pretty much all the preamble. I will only say finally, spoilers. Naturally, for a review and analysis of this depth and length, I am spoiling the whole darn movie. So you are now forewarned. Some would say it came pre-spoiled, but I'm not gonna quibble. With that said, Let's uh, give Scream 6 the uh, treatment that it deserves. It was like, with Mindy be in this headspace? And it was like, you know, this is how these movies work. Like, you know, yeah. What do you do when you're six films into the series? Because franchise fatigue is real. You want to do little innovations, you don't want people getting bored, but you also don't want to move too far from the thing that people love in the series, the thing that people expect. If you're Friday the 13th, when you did your part six, you leaned a little bit more on the meta humor. You knew that people weren't taking it as seriously and they could uh, enjoy a little fourth wall breaking joke. Or another thing you could do is a relocation, which uh, Friday the 13th also did, infamously with part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan. Obviously, Scream 6, also relocating to the big city, made a very direct reference to it very early on. Now, when you do this, when you do these innovations, you don't really want them to be just a superficial change. You don't want them to not deliver on the promise. And that is something that Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, absolutely did. You were promised Jason taking Manhattan. You were shown this poster 
And what you actually got was Jason on a boat and then in some sewers. There was really only this tiny bit in Manhattan with this weird guy. That's probably about the only thing you remember from it. It's about the most Manhattan you got. Now Scream 6 makes this reference, I think, for one thing, uh, because, hey, we also went to the city. But it really could make that reference for another reason, that it completely bailed on the promise of innovation. The opening of Scream 6 is a bait and switch tease, and it really is a sour start to the film. So I'm not going to go in depth in the plot. I'm going to give you the very basics. I assume a certain familiarity because I'm going to spoil the whole film and I'm probably going to spoil the whole series. OK, so I, I hope you have uh, awareness. I hope you're not, not expecting a spoiler free review at this point. That would, that would be foolishness. The opening of Scream 6 is your classic phone call, your ghost face call. Now, that already is a little bit of a problem. You're six films into your franchise. We have seen this many a time. It was already kind of dated enough with people's changing preferences for modes of communication that Scream 4 in 2011 referenced how really the killer should be using social media. And Scream 5 in 2022 had Tara be a bit more modern by also uh, messaging Amber while she took the ghost face call. These were good changes, and I'm not going to delve too deep into why those openers used the call. I'm just going to focus on Scream 6. Scream 6, by doing this call, felt like it was going through the motions a bit. And additionally, because it still needed to take Samara Weaving's character out of the restaurant and into a back alley so the usual stabbing could happen, it kind of felt a bit rote, a bit by the numbers. I was not a huge fan of it. I kind of felt we were going through the motions at this point. Sure enough, she gets into the alley. It's a little unbelievable. It's a little stretch. Like the killer points out, she is a lecturer in slasher films. He mocks her for going into the alley, even though she really should know not to. And obviously she gets a stabbing. It's all what we expect. And I thought, okay, this is kind of average. It's a little mid. But hey, it's a Scream film. This is going to happen. After Ghostface drops a lame joke, I'm expecting the cutaway and it doesn't happen. You know from the editing, you're expecting a cutaway at this point. You're expecting to go into the title sequence. And when it doesn't, suddenly it got a little exciting. You're holding on Ghostface for far much longer than you should. And you start to think, OK, something new is going to happen. And it does. Ghostface takes off the mask in the pre-title sequence. And then suddenly, this was brilliant. This was exciting. Suddenly, the idea was you're going to see the franchise from a whole new angle, knowing Ghostface from the start and having a whole screen film absolutely laden with dramatic irony. This was intriguing. This is innovation. This is really what Scream is about, is innovating on a fairly, you know, tired genre and doing something new and invigorating with it. This reveal got me hooked. And we follow, uh, we follow this new ghost face back. His name is Jason, fittingly enough. And we see him go back to his flat. We see him pass Tara. This is that, uh, that promise of dramatic irony. This fairly um, otherwise unremarkable meeting with Tara, knowing that this is ghost face, knowing that he has just done his first kill laid in the scene with so much more excitement. It was suddenly a great opening. He gets back to the flat and you're kind of hoping there's going to be that title sequence, right? We, we get the title sequence now, but as with the first killing, the decision not to move away kind of told us that actually something else was going to happen. And then this ghost face and his fridge based boyfriend are gone. And we're kind of back on the usual. This was a sudden letdown. After the promise of something new and exciting, we're back doing the usual formula. In the commentary of the film, the writers Guy Busick and James Vanderbilt, who also wrote Scream 5, said that they'd independently arrived at the idea that they wanted to reveal Ghostface in the first 10 minutes. 
That was one of the first things we talked I about. Think so, I think so, right? Yeah. And this was when it was early days. We hadn't uh, mapped out the whole movie yet, but we were just kind of doing our blue sky, like, what, what can we do see? in this in this movie that's different? What would make this exciting and fun for us? And the first meeting we had, I think, story-wise, was over a Zoom. And I'm pretty sure I started, and I was like, I just had this crazy idea that we start with like a traditional screen kill, albeit in New York City, so it's got kind of a fresh flavor. And then we do the uh, throw to credits slash, but we don't go to credits. Yeah. And we hold on Ghostface, and then he removes his mask, and then we follow him. And you had this look on your face, and I was like, oh, he hates it. I'm stupid. This is all. <laughs> That's my resting face. His it resting. Yeah. yeah. So then he holds up a notepad, and written on it is Ghostface takes off mask within the first 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. and I was like, oh my God. We were really insane. We were both. This. We That's amazing. Amazing. I think we share a screen brand. And I also like, I love the idea of opening in an incredibly crowded place yeah, and having the that. audience go, well, how? Yeah. We know she's probably dead meat, but how is she going to be dead meat in a restaurant with 100 people? Yeah, reading the opening, we were just floored from from the first line because, well, Off El Fuego, the name of the restaurant, is also the name of our, <laughs> our text chain. And, a, and, a and I thought, okay, that's cool, but you did that reveal and then you did nothing else with it. So what was the point of revealing who Ghostface is and then going back to an unknown Ghostface? It is a bait and switch. It is promising innovation and then backtracking on it. It is, I'm afraid, a bit of a foreshadowing of what's going to be a major problem of Scream 6, which is cowardice. They're going to back out of anything challenging. They're going to back out of any risk taking and they're going to back out of innovation that you would expect them to deliver. This is a foreshadowing of the cowardice that will plague Scream 6 that I really think is one of the two central problems that I'm gonna cover when I wrap this up. Scream 6 is going to repeatedly flirt with innovation. It's going to flirt with risk, and then it's going to fall back on something safe and on lazily repeating superficial elements of past Scream films, like it is doing a sort of tick box exercise. And worse, they don't even realize what a self-abnegating cock up this was when they included this line. We have to finish the movie. Who gives a f about movies? <laughs> Who gives a f about movies? This line really is Scream 6's David Carradine and Michael Hutchins death moment. You know, it probably felt really good while they were doing it, but uh, it did not lead to anything good. In fact, it leads to a huge plot hole, an absolute fridge logic nuke that gets dropped on the film when you understand who the killers are. And that is going to be the sort of meatiest problem that we discuss here. You're going to be even more bitter when you are promised something cool and interesting and innovative when you see who the killers in Scream 6 actually are. It makes it so much worse. This bait and switch opening is one of the first problems, but it is far from the worst in Scream 6. We're gonna go into that in the next section. The killers are an absolute joke. This section on the absolute state of the choice of killers in Scream 6 is inevitably going to be the longest. There's really nothing I can do to help that. There's so much wrong with it. There are so many unbelievable failures. I, I have to include them. If you want a more concise segment, uh, filmmakers make fewer mistakes. That's all I can say. So if it's not Jason and Fridge Boy, the slightly innovative choice that we were promised, who is it going to be? Who was so much better than that choice? Admittedly, they were motivated by uh, a grievance against their, their tutor. So their motivation wasn't very strong. It was all about the the, the mode of presentation, but we'll we'll move on from that. Well, I'll present you the list of suspects first with a quick catch up on the situation. Chad, Mindy, Sam and Tara are now in the Big Apple, they're in New York, and everyone I believe except Sam is now studying in uni, just as the characters in Scream 2 did, going to uni, very natural. Uh, Sam and Tara share a flat with Quinn. Uh, Sam has a love interest in Danny across the way. 
Uh, Mindy has a girlfriend and Chad is living with Ethan. Mindy may also be living with Chad and Ethan. I'm not certain. That is our range of characters. They are gathered when suddenly the news drops that there's been a murder of some ghost-faced killers. And very shortly after that, Quinn's father, Detective Bailey, calls up Sam and lets her know that her ID has been found on the scene. She and Tara go on the way to the crime scene to meet Detective Bailey, and they are attacked in this sequence that was shown in the trailers. You and Tara better watch your backs. You better watch yours. No! 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 Come on! I'm going to pause at this point because there's been some good writing here. There's been an interesting clue dropped. At this point in the film, I leaned over to my wife and I said, I think I know who the killers are. I named Quinn and Detective Bailey. They are the killers. And I was able to do this because we had a decent clue. When we find out that Sam's driving license has turned up at the crime scene, we can guess it's someone who has access to her stuff very easy access, that points the finger at Quinn. She is their flatmate. It would be very easy for her to get her hands on the stuff. Then, when they're attacked immediately after being called by Detective Bailey, who is really the only person who would know they'd be going there, you have another clue. It makes it pretty likely that Detective Bailey, knowing where they are, is then able to attack them. And so I went on with a pretty strong guess at who the suspects were. Now, there was a second clue about Detective Bailey that bolstered my suspicion. Sam is seeing a therapist, we see this early on. Uh, it doesn't really lead anywhere, so I won't spend much time on it. But when she tells Detective Bailey about the therapist, gives him the info, the therapist is murdered very shortly after. Gotta ask, do you have alibis for earlier tonight? I was at my therapist. I can give you his information. You can call to check if you want. A few moments later. And so I was pretty darn confident in my guess that Quinn and Detective Bailey, a father and daughter team, were doing the killing. So if the man who attacked you did steal your license and planted next to the body, it'd probably be somebody close to you. Yeah, so... Quinn, um, Ethan, Annika, all since then. Well, I think I can vouch for Quinn, so that's one less we have to worry about. Now, I was thrown off a bit. Quinn ended up going off the suspect list at uh, first when uh, we were told that she got to be Sam and Tara's flatmate after responding to an anonymous ad. I thought, okay, yeah, she, she wouldn't have been able to rig it to get with them. So, okay, maybe it's not Quinn. And then I was less suspicious of her when she died. Um, that, that, that kind of took her off the list for me a bit when she was killed in this admittedly very cool sequence when Ghostface attacks them in their apartment. And I will say that this film is pretty darn good with its set pieces. The attack on the apartment is very involving, it is very engaging, it is actually frightening. There is a section on a uh, subway that is also very effective. Um, it's not all bad, but uh, we'll move away from those shiny coin moments because the story is really what we need to pay attention to. That is where the fridge logic comes in and does all the damage. So I remain suspicious of Detective Bailey, but Quinn, being dead, was off the suspect list for me. However, at the end of the film, you learn that Detective Bailey, Quinn, and Ethan are all the killers. They are a killer trio this time. Great job. Both of you. You? Yeah, of course, me. And their motivation is that they are Richie's family and they are avenging him after the events of Scream 5. By the end of this section, you're probably going to feel as cheated and patronized by this choice of killers as I do. For a start, faking Quinn's death is an incredibly unscream like mood. It is very cheating and we will return to this. It, it deserves a little more discussion. We'll, um, you know, put a pin in it there. And there's also the matter of 
the anonymous ad issue that uh, Quinn responded to an anonymous ad. That's how she became Sam and Tara's flatmate. Um, how did you come to live with Sam and Tara? I answered their ad online. Okay, say no more. You've already implicated yourself enough. It was an anonymous ad, Mindy. Now, that's meant to exonerate her. I know that the death thing should be the major issue, but we're going to focus on the flatmate thing because this was one of the major defences for why Quinn couldn't be the killer. She couldn't have uh, wangled her way into being the flatmate because she responded to an anonymous ad. That is never resolved. They're, they never return to this, even though it's a pretty, you know, solid reason. Now, we could invent an idea of how uh, Quinn managed to make that happen, how she managed to get that close to Sam and Tara. You know, we're told that Ethan became Chad's flatmate via a lottery, and they said, well, that could be cheated. Okay. It brings us to our current suspects. Ethan, the shy, dorky guy who no one suspects because he's so shy and dorky. Okay, wait, wh why am I on the suspect list? Because I'm randomly Chad's roommate? Roommate lotteries can be juked. You could have fixed it to get next to us. Okay, maybe Ethan talked to Chad and got the information about the anonymous ad from him and then directed Quinn to it. And she was the successful one out of however many people. I mean, that could have happened, but I am having to invent quite a lot to get around this fairly solid reason of why Quinn couldn't be the killer. Um, but the film doesn't consider it, doesn't address it, doesn't return to it, just gives you this solid defense that it never dismantles. That is bad writing. I kind of feel it's cheating. We are going to hear that quite a lot when we talk about Scream 6. When did it become Richie's family? Do you guys remember? It was pretty early, because we always loved the idea of it being a family doing this. That was sort of the, yeah. the core of it. And I think we were a little bit at first like, because I remember Kevin saying, it's got to be primal, it's got to be emotional. Not just about this, but sort of about all of them. And I think that Guy and I love the, the idea behind Five, but the one thing we felt that was missing was there wasn't a primal connection to right. the victims. It was more intellectual. Right. Um, now, all of that is teeny tiny potatoes in comparison to the far bigger problems that stem from deciding to make Richie's family the killers in Scream 6. It, it, I want to say this is calling down a barrage of fridges full of fridge logic to devastate the enemy position, but realistically, this is barely fridge logic because the problems with this should become apparent the second it's announced. You've probably started thinking of them already, but let's let's just go through a few of them. Once, once you've taken out the sort of shiny coin of the uh, stabby showdown that is the finale, once, that, once that's no longer distracting you, you can start to think why this was a terrible decision. So for one, you start thinking, hang on, Sam didn't know Richie's family? Like, she'd never seen anything of them? Like, did he have a reason to keep them from her? We don't know that, but it seems unlikely. But that's small, that's small. Moreover, we find out that Gail writes a book about the events of Scream 5. Are you really still mad at me? You said you wouldn't write a book about what happened. And then you wrote a book about what happened. Oh, come on. So Gail, a veteran journalist who's done this many a time, researches and writes a book about the events of Scream 5 about Richie and Amber and doesn't come across anything about Richie's family, who at this point would have nothing to hide. Like, they didn't show up in court or anything? No? They just... This was not planned out. There is no way Gail doesn't know who they are. And when she's meeting them face to face, this should have been the end of it. Scream 2, you will note, used a very similar plot and made darn sure that Sydney never met someone she would have recognized until the finale. Told you I had a partner, Sid. Mrs. Loomis? We keep saying that it felt, it feels like a very in, intuition driven movie, that there wasn't yeah. time to like overcook anything because we just no. didn't have time. So it really was, what's the coolest idea? Oh, I love that. Yeah. What's next? Mm -hmm. You were finished with five and Guy and I weren't that far with six. Like it wasn't like we had worked on the script for a year. I will say one of the things I love about the way we all work, and we talked about this before, but it's that, you know, 
we do at, we do treat each movie like the last one. You know, it's, yeah. it's yeah. Like, let's not leave a bunch of stuff for later. Like, yeah. let's put it all into this and Full trust meal. that we'll come up with other stuff. It's fascinating, too, because doing interviews and stuff like that, like, there are people who literally don't believe us. They're like, yeah, 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 but, like, you set some stuff up for Six, right? Because obviously you set up the Tara and Chad romance. We're like, no. We didn't do any, any work that, that at all. Then there's a name angle. Detective Bailey, Quinn Bailey are related to Richie Kirsch. Now, they make sure they show us this. They show Richie calling or someone calling using Richie's phone. And we see the surname is Kirsch. Kirsch is not Bailey, obviously. They, I think, wanted us to notice this so we didn't suspect the Baileys. But this gets you thinking, did they just change their name and identities within a year? Um, Detective Bailey, as a police officer whose son has gone on to murder a bunch of people, is he able to just change his name from Detective Kirsch to Detective Bailey and move into a new precinct, move into a new role and get involved with the Ghostface killings again? and no one is confirmed about this? Like, is he really able to completely change his identity after a scandal and remain within the same police force, within the same job even, and not be found out? We spend an extra amount of time making sure that it makes sense, that the scene makes sense for it to for it to belong. That was that was making me curious with the three of them, because I don't think you say it in the movie. What, what are their real names? What, I'm sorry, I think we have to go. Right, yeah, that. exactly, look at the time. <laughs> We've had this debate a lot. Of oh. like, yeah. Where are the fake names? Where are the real names? Is, is Bailey Richie real? Kirsch? Is Bailey Kirsch? real or is it Kirsch? Yeah. yeah. It's a, and we have an internal debate with us and Guy and Jamie. Stone. I think we've decided, I think we've decided, to, correct me if I'm wrong, that Richie's, Richie Kirsch is a pseudonym yeah. and Bailey is also a pseudonym, that the real name is whoever they were in the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah, but then there's an issue with that tracking with him transferring to the NYPD. Yeah, the NYPD. Right, NYPD. Yeah. Oh, my head uh, is exploding. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's it does. Yeah, you go back that like right two right layers. <laughs> we spend an extra amount of time making sure that it makes sense, that the scene makes sense. The matter of changing the identity is a huge plot hole. If you start thinking for that about that for even a second, you are going to come up with all sorts of problems about how he was not... Uh, you know, immediately put on leave or something. This is only a year after the events of Scream 5. The fact that he would be working and able to get involved with the Ghostface case, I, I am not convinced. I mean, we could go with more details, but there's enough here to label it a major problem. And it, it, you know, when we first saw the assembly, we had all the, like, the logic questions of, well, like, is Kirby right over there? What about Chad? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it, None of it matters. Just don't let the uh, that just don't let that air in. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly right. It's not about that. We had all the like the logic questions, but it none of it matters. None of it matters. Then there's a bit of fridge logic in that otherwise wonderful attack on the apartment set piece that we talked about. Sam's love interest Danny sees through the window Quinn being threatened and menaced by Ghostface. We know and can work out that that is Quinn and Ethan, but. As they are both killers, why are they play acting? Did did they know Danny was going to watch? Did they want Danny to try and signal to everyone else to warn them? They really don't have any good justif justifiable reason to play act. In fact, it looks like they don't see that Danny's watching them until, uh, well, quite late in proceedings. So why would he not have seen some shenanigans? We had all the, like, the logic questions, but it none of it matters. Again, they are hitting you with the shiny coin of the set piece and hoping you do not think too hard about this stuff. Hoping that you don't think back and go, well, hang on. Yeah. Why were they pretending to be victims? Who were they pretending for? The answer is that they were pretending for you, the audience, and they didn't expect you to interrogate it. But again, this is six months on from the release. This is uh, three viewings of the film into it. And we start to notice these details we start to unravel it. I also need to throw in a minor nitpick about a retcon that they did to the motivations of Richie from Scream 5 in that they changed his interest from being about the stab movies to being about the real life murders that inspired the stab movies. And they did this because they wanted a set piece location in an old cinema 
full of memorabilia. The memorabilia that we've seen from the real life Scream incidents um, and a tiny little section on the Stab movies. But Richie was motivated by the Stab movies. He went and did his own um, real life killings because he wanted it to inspire a new wave of Stab movies. We do not know that he was as interested in the real life stuff. This hall, this cinema, should be full of stab memorabilia, which also would be a lot easier to get your hands on and far less suspicious. The fact that there is so much uh, here taken from police evidence lockers is once again pretty strong clue to Detective Bailey. You know, they try and give you a weasel away, a little line explaining it could be any police officer really, but when it's already giving you quite a few clues to suspect Detective Bailey, it's making it far too obvious. So, minor nitpick, but it's important because it's kind of cheating. Also, the commentary ended up actually debating this. Should it be full of stab stuff or should it be full of scream stuff? The other thing is this evolved in the script as well. Originally, you know, it was a warehouse mm -hmm. with all of this stuff in it. Um, and it was always it was always stuff from the from the actual murders, not the stab things. I think I saw something where one of you guys was like it was from the movies. I think it was always stuff from. It was mm -hmm. my memory is that it was like not not all of either. There was a mixture because I remember I us I remember having that. so many conversations about I think we need to choose a lane on this. But maybe you maybe. could totally be right, guy. Do you remember? I think it was always the scream stuff. I always thought it was the scream stuff, and no, it was. I know no, there was a stab. Clapper, which we there's the was clapper in the and the, yeah, yeah. And the, and the, yeah. the original cut of uh, Stab Three, but it wasn't. Yeah. But it, but but regardless of that, like it was a, it was always sort of a warehouse because we were like, where can we set a right. a, a final yeah. sequence that's really cool that hasn't been done before? Like that was a big thing for us. And then I remember you guys were scouting, and you were like, so we found a movie theater, and I remember thinking to myself, oh no, like it's Scream Two. If you are being faithful to the world of Scream, if you are being faithful to the characters that you've already written, then it should be stab memorabilia. But, in a very unselfconscious way, they are making this for you. They want it to be important to you, so they filled it with Scream memorabilia. It's quite a tell about their understanding of what they're doing. I hear you're a horror fan. It's been said. This was a scene that we love, love, loved in the script. And I feel like the scene itself never changed, but mm -hmm. the, the location of it changed yes. probably three times. Yeah, a bunch of oh times. My God. Yeah. It we was in the van for a while. Because it, yeah. it was this thing where it was sort of like, how do you, and again, it's scream logic, right? So yes. it's, it works, but it's like, we were like, well, if it happens here, it happens right after Annika died and the left, you know what I mean? It was sort of like, would Mindy be in this headspace? <laughs> Candyman, the original or equal? Both. Both. Okay. Okay. Game recognized game. Oh, now that's in poor taste. It was sort of like, would Mindy be in this headspace? And it was like, no, this is how these movies work. Like, you know, yeah. We'll move on. Those are massive issues with the choice of killers in Scream 6, and I really feel that they show a lack of planning. In fact, they're deriving from a lack of planning. They did not have anything set up, and they will actually talk about this on the commentary. I will say one of the things I love about the way we all work, and we talked about this before, but it's that, you know, we do have, we do treat each movie like the last one. You know, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Like, let's not leave a bunch of stuff for later. Like, yeah. let's put it all into this and Full trust meal. that we'll come up with other stuff. It's fascinating, too, because doing interviews and stuff like that, like, there are people who literally don't believe us. They're like, yeah, 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 but like, you set some stuff up for six, right? Because obviously you set up the Tara and Chad romance. We're like, no, we didn't do any, any work that? that at all. Now, I'm actually quite sympathetic to the problems that they talk about here in the commentary when they say they didn't have time to work on it because they were trying to get it out in a year. And I would merely suggest that, yeah, that, that is tough, but maybe don't aim to get a sequel out in a year. Maybe 
give yourself an extra six months to work on the script, get a really solid story, maybe be able to renegotiate with Nev Campbell and get Sydney back in, and then go for a Halloween release. You could have done that. But they 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 had the deadlines they had, and part of it, as they'll also say, is they didn't plan in advance, they didn't set anything up. And that makes it kind of ironic, given that in Scream 5, they went out of their way to simp for Rian Johnson, uh, who also caused huge franchise problems by not setting up anything in advance and not doing that planning ahead. Just, just a nice little bit of irony that we uncovered here. Okay, remember the Stab movie that came out last year? Oh yeah, the one the Knives Out guy directed, right? No, I actually really liked that one. Of course you did, you have terrible taste. So we have established that the family vengeance angle is a bad one to take, they should not have done it, it causes all kinds of world building issues. And uh, the, the filmmakers were worried about that too. They thought it was too close to Scream 2. And because this is effectively uh, the sequel to the reboot of the series, uh, they are effectively Scream 2 themselves. And so they had, a, they had a good amount of reason to worry about just copying it, you know. They're sending the characters off to uni, just like in Scream 2. They have a family vengeance angle, just like in Scream 2. They have a uh, huge number of... Sorry, well, not a huge number, but they've increased the number of killers, as was the original plan for Scream 2, and the finale is basically in a theatre. Now, they quibble this in the commentary. They say, oh, we're not copying Scream 2. This is a cinema, not a theatre, but look at the back there. Look at that theatrical curtain. I am not convinced. It is basically a Scream 2 theatrical finale again. They didn't manage to dodge that bullet. But, um... We're not going to be distracted by that. We've dealt with that. We need to look further into it and to quote clipped coin. But wait, it gets worse. Who gives a fuck about movies? Yes, indeed. Who gives a hoot about movies? I don't like to swear. It's it's a thing. Anyway, don't be distracted by that. Focus on the line. Who gives a hoot about movies? They are not motivated by movies, okay? That's what we got from that line. They killed a set of ghost faces who were motivated by movies, but they don't, right? That's interesting. That's innovation, right? That's not a massive problem in the plot, right? Let's get into this. So if they don't care about ghost face lore, as that line establishes, they, they don't give a hoot about movies. That's the old ghost face duo. They've been killed off the trio, they don't give a hoot about movies. They aren't concerned. Well, if they aren't concerned about movies, if they don't care, if that's not their motivation, why are they doing the ghost face shtick? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Once we've seen the film, once we've heard their motivation, we can rewatch it and start asking ourselves, do their actions make sense given that? So they don't care about stab. They don't care about ghost face. Why are they dressing up as Ghostface? Why did they do that to do this murder at the start? If all they want to do is kill Sam and Tara, well, they can do that really easily. They can take the time with it. They've got access to them in the apartment. That is no problem whatsoever. So, you know, they could just murder them in their sleep. Super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Now, obviously, Billy and Stu wouldn't have taken this approach because Billy and Stu were motivated by horror movies. And a lot of the stuff they're doing is motivated by them trying to recreate, trying to live out their own horror movie using horror movie logic. This is the sort of basic understanding of Scream that you have to do. This explains a lot of the illogicality in their actions. Why on earth would Billy and Stu be out in daytime in the ghost face costume here and here? Why, why would they do that? Why risk being captured in daylight here? It's because Billy and Stu are wanting to copy the horror movie icons that they know and love. That is why they are doing these horror movie tropes, reenacting them in a real world environment. But the trio in Scream 6 don't care about movies. They just want a brutal revenge on Sam and Tara, Sam in particular. Who gives a fuck about movies? Now, they give us an attempt at a justification. I'm not convinced by it, but they at least recognize this problem needed justification, so. Your father's. I'm gonna need 
you to put it on. Who gives a fuck about movies? Because it's not enough to just kill someone these days. You have to assassinate their character first. So when Dad here discovers your horribly mutilated bodies, <laughs> posed with Sam wearing her father's mask, he'll say some poor dumb bastard read on the internet that you're the real ghost face and took matters into their own deluded hands. Exactly, that's why it's the perfect alibi. The justification is that they are hoping to blame the killings of Sam and Tara on a Richie truther on a conspiracy-minded Woodsboro subreddit. That is, that's what they're going for. That's the plan. Yeah, that's what we gotta work with. But I didn't commit those murders in Woodsboro. It wasn't me. Oh, we know that. Of course you didn't. What do you think this is based on? Some bullshit conspiracy theory? Come on. Who do you think started the rumors about you in the first place? Now, whilst that's all very current day and globalist agenda of you, Scream 6, very good. I'm sure you'll get your ESG points for that one. Did you stop to consider that that is a huge plot hole in that the perfect Patsy already exists in this film and they showed it in the pre-title sequence? Jason and Fridge Boy, you already have a pair of budding ghost faces out murdering that the trio know about and they know about them because they're able to get into their apartment and wipe them out. But instead of, you know, letting them do their thing and then the trio getting their horrible, brutal, nasty revenge on Sam and Tara and then pointing the entire police force at Jason and Fridge Boy and then walking away scot-free. Um, instead, they kill the competition for no understandable reason and then hope that they can frame an as-yet unidentified Reddit anon for the heckin' murderinos. Why? Exactly, that's why it's the perfect alibi. Again, this is one of those things that if you think it out, once you're out of the cinema, once the sort of emotion of everything and the sort of cinematic momentum of the story, once that's cooled down, when you're just rethinking over things, looking at people's motivations, you start to think, why did you do that? This is this is a plot hole in... Uh, well, as, as explained very well by JXE, basically, this is one where a character has a really obvious solution and just ignores it. Classic plot hole. It's a perfect alibi. Do you want toxic fandoms? Because that's how you get toxic fandoms. I, I'm just saying, I don't think Wes Craven would have let that one slide. I don't think Kevin Williamson would have let that one slide. The choice of killers in Scream 6 represents a far more significant problem of the foundational basis and purpose of Scream, or the lack of understanding of it. Now, I'm going to talk about that a lot more in the final section in this analysis, but just shortly, Scream's world is metatextual. It is meant to be an in-genre critique of the horror subgenre. It should encounter horror logic but it's not meant to actually uncritically embody it. Real stab movies are meta slasher whodunits, full stop. Billy and Stu murdered people in a ghost face costume because they wanted to imitate the slasher icons that they love and were obsessed with. The trio here do not have that motivation. They do not have that justification. Scream 6 is just making them do it because it's a Scream movie. That's the real reason for it. That is a, a sort of um, extra textual, paratextual justification for it. It's because you, the audience, expect it. Just like they know you, the audience, will respond more to memorabilia from the Scream films and not to memorabilia from the Stab films, which is what you should have seen. Scream 6 is just unthinkingly reproducing horror logic, and that is a failure of the spirit of the series. Having Richie's family be the killers and having those family don the ghost face costume, as we covered, are two absolutely massive problems for Scream 2 that sink the film already. But there are smaller issues with this choice of killers that I do think we should cover while we're doing a comprehensive analysis. And one is the number of killers. We've gone up to three for the first time. And while we expect multiple killers in a Scream film, this does feel excessive. This is a bit of a problem. It's kind of exhausting. And I would also venture 
it's kind of cheating. Now, in the original ending of Scream 2, in the first script, there were going to be four killers. And I'm kind of split on that idea. In some ways, it's very clever. In some ways, it creates a whole load of problems. Ultimately, when everything was getting messed around with the scripts being leaked, Scream 2 didn't go with it. They abandoned it and they just stuck with two killers. But they had thought about having four. Now, of the bad impacts that that has on the story, one of them is that it starts to feel parodic. It starts to feel ridiculous. Four killers is just a huge number of them, okay? Screen 2 talked about the unnecessary escalation that you get in sequels, the gratuitousness, the excess of gore, the excess of victims, and the sort of extra drama that they tend to go when it becomes far less grounded and far less realistic. And Scream did try to be a realistic world that had horror movie obsessives in it. So it's our job to observe the rules of the sequel. Number one, the body count is always bigger. Number two, the death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. Carnage candy. Now, if Scream 2 had actually gone ahead and had four killers, it would be making a critique and also embodying it. It would be hypocritical. It is like saying films are far too sweary and then dropping C-bombs all over the place. Therefore, I think it was kind of wise that they didn't do it. I think it's far better if you're doing a in-genre critique to highlight the thing that you want to criticize, but then provide a better alternative. That is what Scream 2 did. Scream 6 falls straight into that trap. It regularly embodies, uncritically, the things that it is criticizing. The criticism just doesn't land when you're doing the thing, okay? You, you can't eat your cake and have it too, as a wise man once said. And now I want to return to the matter of Quinn's fake death. I did say we would get back to it, we put a pin into it there, and now we are here to discuss it. In, in short, there are two major problems with it. One, it's very much uncritically embodied movie logic. It doesn't fit with Scream. Doing this kind of movie trope uncritically is not what we expect from a Scream movie. Uh, we, we expect a certain logic within a Scream film. Um, how can I, how can I say? There's a formula to it, a very simple formula. Hey, roomies. You didn't see that one coming, did you? Yeah, because you died. You kind of didn't, though. So. The trio faking Quinn's death is a breach of the expected logic. It is cheating. It doesn't belong in a Scream movie. And in the filmmaker's commentary, they had the cheek to say that they were inspired by Agatha Christie in it. And you, you might not know this, folks, but I, I have something of a Christie expert uh, at my disposal. And when they said that they were inspired by Agatha Christie and one of her most famous works, I, I had to take a pause. It's an opportunity I couldn't resist. So for your benefit, for your greater education and uh, cultural enrichment, I, I know we don't get much of that these days in Britain, here is Waifu talking about her actual expert subject, Agatha Christie, and telling you why the filmmakers are absolute morons in this respect. Waifu, over to you. So why has the name of Agatha Christie, the queen of crime, the doyenne of detective fiction, been brought in to the world of Scream 6? Why has she been referenced? Well, it's because one of her most famous stories and the plot of Scream 6 both revolve around one of the murderers faking their own death. The question is, why is one of those stories the absolute pinnacle of a cherished writer's career, her greatest technical achievement, while the other is a steaming embarrassment that the writers should have been ashamed to put to paper, let alone for the plot twist to have survived all the way into the final cut of a multi-million dollar film? Ten little nits- Whoa, 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 YouTube! Really? Yeah. Ten little in- yeah, risky, risky. Y use a new title. Fine. And then there were none. It's Agatha Christie's most famous novel, her greatest technical achievement, and the best-selling crime novel of all time. That's a quote from John Curran's lovely book, which is an examination of Agatha Christie's personal notebooks, in which a lot of the workings out for her novels were done. It's a lovely book, you should read it. If you haven't heard of And Then There Were None, Zoomer's 
educate yourselves. As I said, it's one of the most daring, audacious and impressive crime novels of all time, and it remains one of the best-selling ones of all time. Um, it was published in 1939, pretty much the pinnacle of Agatha Christie's career. The 30s, the 1930s, had seen the publication of some of her now most enduring works, including The Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile. She was truly coming into her powers as a writer. And, and Then There Were None is almost... It takes it a step further. It's her kind of taking the genre that she'd really made her own and shaking it up completely. It's a phenomenal achievement. And in fact, part of the reason for that is because Agatha Christie worked so hard on it. She viewed detective fiction as creating puzzles for the reader and she took it incredibly seriously. Once she'd come up with the idea for the novel, she worked really hard. She worked for months to figure out the mechanics of it and to make sure that actually the plot she was proposing worked and made sense. The twist is the point. It's not an afterthought, it's not an add-on, it's not thrown in to be flashy or to make the reader go, wow, it's the heart of the novel. She came up with the, the idea for it and built the novel around that twist. If you've not read it before or not come across it, I'll briefly summarise the plot. There are spoilers ahead. If you'd like to read the novel unspoiled, which I really recommend, skip this bit, come back to it once you've read the novel, you'll thank me. But the plot of Ten of... Wait, I nearly said it. The plot of And Then There Were None revolves around ten people who have been invited to a remote island off the coast of Devon. Once they get there, a storm comes in. There is no way back off the island to get to the mainland. There is also therefore no way for anyone on the mainland to get to the island. The phone lines are down. They can't reach out for help. It's also established very early on that it is an exposed, vulnerable, um, isolated place. There is no possibility that there is anyone else on the island hiding out there. It's just those ten people. There are no outsiders. The pool of suspects comes from this isolated group. And then, one by one, the individuals on the island start to be picked off by an unseen murderer. Eventually, all ten people are dead, and from the reader's perspective, the last person to die is not the murderer. So how does it work? When the twist is revealed, it's brilliant. It's breathtaking. And that's why it's got such an enduring power. Early critics said, you know, it requires a certain amount of suspension of disbelief. It's it's a bit far-fetched, but to an extent, it's a detective writer at the height of her powers showing exactly what she could do. And that's why it has such an enduring impact on the genre and on a lot of other culture, as we've seen by the very glib reference to it made by Scream 6's writers, when they're talking about the twist in their film of Quinn faking her own death. Personally, I think comparing that twist in any way to Agatha Christie is an insult, and I'm going to explain why. We're going to examine the two using the classic detective framework of looking at means, motive and opportunity. What are the means, motive and opportunity in each case for the murderers to fake their own death? How does it serve them in their overall ultimate goal? How does it serve them in their overall ultimate goal? So, let's start with an end, and then there were none. Our murderer has orchestrated everything. He is in fact the person who has invited everyone to the island. He has planned this down to the nth degree. He knows that with a dwindling number of suspects, it's increasingly likely that people will work out who the killer is. It, it becomes less, less and less easy to hide when there are fewer of you. So he knows that the best way for him to succeed is to fake his own death so that he can essentially operate from outside the grounds of suspicion. How does he do that? Well, one of the people on the island is a doctor. He takes this man into his supposed confidence, saying that for them to solve the crimes and protect everyone else on the island, one of them needs to fake their own death. It's the exact same reasoning. The doctor buys it, the doctor believes him, trusts him because of his status in society, and agrees to go along with it. So they set up the fake death. The doctor goes over and examines the corpse, telling everyone else to stay back. No one else gets close enough to look at it. The doctor, who they trust because he has the relevant expertise, looks at the corpse tells everyone he's dead, and then shuts the door of the room. No one else gets close. No one else needs to get close. You don't need other experts to come in and examine the body. Everyone takes the doctor's word for it. And then, before the doctor can get cold feet, have questions, worry about what he's done, he's the next victim. He's taken out straight away. 
Our murderer is safe. No one can give away what he's done. There's no need to switch bodies. As I said, there's no need to kind of bamboozle anyone else. It's all sorted. By that point, our murderer is fully in control. At the end of the novel, the police get to the island. From the reader's perspective, we've seen 10 people be murdered and we don't know who the killer is. We're as, as confused as the police. We're as in the dark. And therefore, in the one slight contrivance of the novel, the police then come across a message in a bottle which contains our murderer's full confession, in which he explains what he did and how, and how he orchestrated that faking of his own death. It pulls the rug out from under the reader's feet and it's beautifully executed. So now let's look at means and opportunity for the killers in Scream 6. How exactly are they going to get away with faking Quinn's death? What are the differences? Well, first of all, Quinn's murder takes place in a student flat in a busy, I'm guessing it's called a brownstone, in central New York. There are lots of people walking past, and we know that there are lots of police who will then eventually examine the body and secure the crime scene. Which means they need to have a convincing corpse to replace Quinn's with. Because, if you know one thing about the police, it's that they generally don't like losing evidence, particularly corpses. There's this thing called the chain of evidence, which needs to stay secure, protected and well documented in order to protect the integrity of a trial. Unless the Clintons require you to switch the cameras off, in which case all bets are off. Apart from that, the police tend to want to keep an eye on evidence. As I said, particularly bodies. Bodies are useful in murder trials. You need to be able to prove who died, how and when. So how do our gang of three want to manage this body switch? They've only got two choices. The first is they've stashed the body of a random ginger in the flat in advance, or they bring it up with them at the point they're going to commit the murders. The alternative is they switch the body somewhere between the flat and the morgue, preferably before they start the autopsy, which would probably be fatal for Quinn. Slashing your chest open, not great survival rate. So, taking that, switching the body in the flat to start with, how is Ghostface going to get the corpse up the stairs? Let's say they've managed to find, conveniently, a random ginger woman of the same age, same build, and broadly similar facial appearance to Quinn somewhere in New York. They've killed her in exactly the same way that they are planning to fake Quinn's death, and they've got that body ready to go. Do we have Ghostface kind of carry it up the stairs under the robe? That's going to hamper the movement. That's going to make it quite hard to do. Certainly doesn't dump it on the sofa while he carries out the rest of the killing. Do we have a pulley system out the window and winch the body up from the street level? Again. No evidence of that, plus it would probably be quite noticeable for passers-by in the middle of, as I said, a busy New York street. You're going to notice a corpse go past the window. So, getting the corpse into the flat, probably not doable. Even if we skip past that, the next question is, how does Quinn get back out of the flat? We see that Chad and Tara spend most of this attack outside the only entrance to the flat, hammering on the door trying to get in. At what point does Quinn get out? Tara and Chad probably aren't leaving until the police arrive to break in and try and help. So Quinn has no opportunity to escape. Does she just hide in the cupboard for several hours? Again, police are probably going to be examining in there, so that's going to be hard to do. So, switching the body in the flat, out of the question. What about somewhere between the police arriving, securing the crime scene, and the autopsy? Let's look at that possibility. Well. First of all, for this to work, it requires the NYPD to be sending their special educational needs squad out. Because at some point, some bright spark is going to be leaning over the corpse. And police officers, particularly in homicide squads, are pretty well trained to recognise dead bodies. It's kind of part of the job description. The signs of respiration are quite hard to mistake. She'll be warm, she'll be breathing, she'll have a pulse. Also, at close examination, you'll be able to see that it's fake blood. It's going to be hard to convince them that she's actually dead. Even if the police officers don't spot it, you'll also have medical examiners there, forensic experts who will be taking crime scene photos and doing that initial examination of the body to first of all try and establish a cause of death. Someone's going to pick it up. Assuming, again, just for a second that they're not paying attention, that they've really sent Sesame Street along, she's not, they're not going to... I mean, okay. Let's pretend that someone somehow doesn't notice that this corpse is not actually a corpse. At what point between the van 
and the sort of the autopsy table, does the body switch happen? Because in order for that to happen, as I said, you've got the chain of evidence. Someone's going to need to get paid or bribed to switch the body. Because otherwise, there's really no way to do it. Even if that happens, even if they somehow manage to make it work, they're going to notice pretty quickly that the corpse on the table is not the same as the girl whose photo ID they will have, whose pictures will be up on the wall of the flat. So that only gives Bailey and his son maybe maximum 24 hours before someone says, that's not your daughter, what's going on here? It doesn't actually help them much. So, essentially, the killers in Scream 6 don't have the means or the opportunity to carry out this, this faking of the bodies because their plot revolves around them being in a situation in which multiple experts are examining both the crime scene and the corpse. They can't get away with it. In contrast, in And Then There Were None, there is one medical expert who's already on side. He's an accomplice. He thinks he's helping out a good guy for the right reasons. And he gets taken out straight away. There's no hole in that plan. Sadly, it does mean we have to rule out the entertaining corpse on a pulley system, which really did entertain me for a while, but I think we have to let it go. So now let's get on to motive. Not just the motive for the overall crimes, but what's the motive for the killer in each case to need to fake their own death? Why is that crucial? Well, again, spoilers for and then there were none. Our murderer is a judge. In a twist that's kind of probably helped to inspire Dexter, he reveals in his confession letter that throughout his life he has been ruled by two warring passions. One, to see justice done and a very rigid determination of what justice is. The other passion is a pathological desire to commit murder. And he reveals that as his life has gone on, he's felt that urge to kill getting stronger and stronger and more and more irresistible. So he decides that he's going to take himself out and in doing so, serve the cause of justice that he so passionately cares about. So he invites nine other people to this island, people whom he believes to have, who have got away with murder at some point in their lives. He's got convincing evidence to believe they're guilty. They all arrive on the island as his victims. He's declared himself their judge, jury and executioner. And he considers himself among the number because of an incident earlier in his career where he essentially condemned a man to hang that he knew was innocent. Not a problem in the modern era without the death penalty. Judges who want to kill people sadly have to do other things. So he wants to carry out all nine murders without getting caught and then take himself out because he also considers himself to be guilty. The best way for him to commit the rest of the murders is to fake his own death because as I said, that reduces the likelihood that someone will work out that it's him. It means that he is most likely to kill the people that he knows to be guilty and then be able to take himself out on his own terms. The plot, in fact, needs him to fake his own death. It requires that to happen. So it makes sense. So what about our Ghostface trio? What in their plan requires Quinn to fake her own death? What's, what's their motive? Hang on, um, I'm sure I had something for this. Um, so I've got notes on here. I'm pretty sure I, I mean, I guess to gain the trust of the diversity friendly four, because then Bailey is, you know, one of the fellow victims like them. He's a survivor. He's lost someone. They trust him. It's kind of flimsy and he was kind of already on side to start with ish. So that's quite weak. I guess, actually, here's one. It works because they really care about movies, because this is a screen movie, right? They really care about films. This is some kind of commentary on horror films and slashes and lazy tropes. You know, one thing that I've noticed in a fair few horror films that I can't name off the top of my head, but Proper Horror Show will have a list, is, you know, a lot of films now like to lean on that big, massive twist as a surprising moment for their audience. It makes everyone kind of blow up and get amazed. And that's often an excuse for quite lazy writing. So, so our killers are, oh no wait, because right at the start in one of their first kills they said, Who gives a fuck about movies? So that doesn't work, because they're not doing this because they care about horror films. They're not doing this as a commentary on lazy film writing. And any other motivation is, is also quite weak. 
So why does it serve them for Quinta Fick her own death? How does it help her? How does it help the family? Does it provide the other two with an alibi? Well, not really, because Scream movies and the Scream universe has established very early on that multiple killers is common. So just because one of the two has an alibi means nothing when you're expecting there to be a second killer. So her death doesn't actually help provide anyone with an alibi. And also, you know, if you want to set her up as the the killer for the rest of the crimes and then she's dead, so, you know, then no one needs to pursue the other two, well, she gets killed halfway through the spree. So there are other crimes for which they would then end up being guilty of. So that doesn't work either. There's no purpose for her to fake her death at this point. Plus, they were clearly expecting to get away with it. Their plan at the end, when they give their big talk about what their, their sort of overall intention was, was for them to be innocent and to carry on living their lives. Which means if Quinn's faked her own death, she has to be able to set herself up with a new identity and live a new life. In this world of increasing surveillance and social media, her face is going to be everywhere as one of the victims of the tragic ghost face spree killings. Which means that when she tries to set, you know, work at a new job, get a driver's license, people are going to spot the similarity. Faking your own death is really hard. Ask me how I know. Sorry. Um, anyway, the biggest stab in the jugular for this mega plot twist is that the ghost face motivation is to kill the Fab Four. As we've said, they don't give a hoot about horror movies. And at the point they're in the flat, there's two ghost faces in the flat and they've got everyone trapped in one room. Quinn could just start turning people's brains into pulled pork with a knife. She could just pull one out of her back pocket. They're trapped in there with her. It's a perfect opportunity. Why, why not do that? Oh no. No, you're just going to slather yourself in fake blood and play dead for several hours instead. Why? She only does that if the intention was never for the attack on the flat to work in the first place, if they were never intending to take anyone out at that point, because they want to get them to the big, grand, cinematic location for the finale. Which only works if you've got killers who care about horror movies. There's just no point for them to do that at that point. In fact, the only motivation for faking Quinn's death comes when you step into the meta level and it's because the writers thought it would be cool. And that's not a good enough reason to do it because this is a huge twist. Faking your killer's death and have them come back relies on you respecting your audience enough to give them something to hold on to. You need your audience to come with you all the way and believe in you and be committed to the story you're telling. If you're throwing it in there because you think it's kind of fun, then it's going to fall flat. The plot holes alone are enough for people to start questioning, and that makes the rest of your premise crumble. The best modern horror comparison to And Then There Were None is not Scream 6. It's Saw. It's the original Saw, which absolutely nailed it, because it works on the same premise. Look at it. Strong motivation. Jigsaw believes that people aren't living their lives... Authentically enough, adequately enough, he's punishing people for wasting the wonderful gift they've got. He also wants to stay in the room to control the scenario. He's orchestrated it so that he can manage what's happening. Tip. There's no chance for the two people trapped in the room with his supposed corpse to examine the body. A crucial plot point in Saw is they're chained up. That's why we get the particularly gruesome ending. So he won't get found out. He can stay there for the whole time, essentially in control of what's going on. And that almighty twist, it works, because everything else has been factored in and considered and planned. The twist is the point. And that's why it works in And Then There Were None, because Agatha Christie planned the whole novel around the premise. I've got another quote from her, which I love. Let me just find it. So this is from the Agatha Christie Companion, which uses the original title for the novel. Christie ended a decade of brilliant detective novels with one of her most brilliant deceptions. She was especially proud of the plot of Ten Little Vibrant Scholars. It was so difficult to do, the idea fascinated me, she said. It was well received and reviewed, but the person who was really pleased with it was myself, for I knew better than any critic how difficult it had been. 
As I said at the start, she dedicated months to planning the plot for this novel. She spent a long time examining it from all angles and from different perspectives to make sure that the mechanics of it, the motivation of it, everything hung together. Sadly, a lot of the, the notebooks in which she carried out that planning have since been lost, but we can see just from the notes that do survive just how focused she was on getting it right. She spent months working on it because of her ultimate respect for her readers. She knew that people would read the novel with an eye to trying to solve it and to try and fix it. She knew her readers want to pick holes and try and spot the flaws in order to spot the murderer before it's revealed. And so she created the novel in such a way that they have to come with her that you have to believe her and stay with her on the journey through this phenomenal twist. And she stuck the landing because of her respect for her craft and for her readers. In contrast, the writers of Scream 6 just thought, oh, that'll be cool, and then tried to shoehorn it in. They didn't think through how it would work, demonstrably given the logistics of what to do with the corpse. They didn't think through how it might work, how it would affect the rest of the plot or the motivations for the characters. They did that because they don't care about you as an audience. They don't expect you to think. They want you to just watch it, get to that big twist, and have a big soy face wow reaction. Because that's all they want. They don't want you to actually critically engage with the content they're putting out there for you. They just want you to pay your money and take a choice. And that, to me, is the biggest insult, not only to Agatha Christie, but to Wes Craven himself. See that one coming, did you? Yeah, because you died. You kind of didn't, So. I hope you enjoyed that little aside. I, I couldn't resist including it since uh, since we had a chance to do a bit of Christie posting. Now, we've been going over some fairly big problems with the central plot, the central characters of the film, and these are not subtle problems. These are not things that you have to really dig into the detail to find out. These are obvious problems that you can pick up as you're watching the film for the first time, let alone the kind of fridge logic over what they do killing the original duo as the trio when they need an alibi. But the thing is, we can point these out and I think the writers just didn't care. And I say this because of the commentary, because of comments like this. We had all the, like, the logic questions, but it, none of it matters. Even some of the better elements of the film are affected by this. So the really effective set piece when Ghostface attacks them in the apartment is marred by this kind of lack of thinking. You have a good moment when Sam runs into the kitchen to get some knives so that she can defend herself, so she can attack Ghostface. And she finds all the knives are gone. And you think, okay, that's a really good clue. Like the driving license, that's telling us that Ghostface has easy access to their apartment. And that starts you thinking about who the killers are, but you might miss the fact that they were just sitting down to dinner. They managed to make a whole meal, prep a whole meal, without using any knives. Like, does that make any sense to you? Also, they just prepared a whole meal with no knives. <laughs> that's, that's, by the way, that's, we had that conversation right. when we were talking about what are they cooking. Right. We were like, well, that's this Terry's got to be picking yeah. herbs for a salad Noodles and not salad. cutting it's it in a stew. <laughs> That's a kind of ridiculous thing that comes up. It, is it terrible? Not really. Is it a plot hole? Certainly. Is it, is it sloppiness? Sloppiness is probably the best description for it. The filmmakers themselves, in the audio commentary, picked up on that. They saw it too, and they highlighted it. But they just kind of laugh it off. They just laugh it off. Bit of sloppiness in the movie. They didn't care. Now, there are plenty of other ridiculous failures of logic in the film that we could focus on, we could talk about in the finale, Detective Bailey not shooting Sam at multiple points, either from the ground when he would have a clear shot, or far less forgivably, right here on the balcony where she charges at him and he just goes, arg. Those are really just the silly cherry on top of the plot hole cake. Um, they're ridiculous, but really they are minor compared to the identity, choice and plan of the killers, which is atrocious. And that is the spine of the movie. When that is messed up, your film does not stand up. 
that is why I wanted to spend so much time focusing on that and not the kind of stuff that Cinema Sins would try and pick out. And it makes me wonder, after the success of Scream 5, which I really liked, I genuinely think it was a good way to reboot the franchise and re-energize it, how did they mess this up? Was it, was it the time pressure that they had less than a year to write this? Was it the pressure of the studios going, you've got your million dollar contract, we're all waiting for your hot track? W was it that? I don't know, but for all these reasons, the killers of Scream 6 are an absolute embarrassment and their centrality to the plot, their centrality to Scream 6, makes it a very bad movie. Now we're going to move slightly away from the plot here and talk about the wasted premises in the film. That is going to be the topic of the next section. In this mercifully shorter section, I'm going to be addressing the wasted premises of Scream 6. That is the nominal topic of franchises. And uh, I'm also going to provide my own fix to that. Uh, but also the idea of urban horror, which I feel really hasn't been discussed enough or hasn't been discussed in a way that I think is really capturing the essence of it, capturing the idea correctly. Now, on the idea of their nominal topic of franchises, I... I got a little bit of a warning sign when this came up, partly because the idea of criticizing horror franchises is kind of done, it's kind of played out, so I wondered what else are they really going to say about franchises, what have they got new to say, but also because I have to say this, Scream 5, as much as I like it, really did a bad job of its central topic, which was toxic fandom. Now obviously that's a very current issue, but that's not a problem in and of itself. Scream is there to address the current issue in horror. However, I don't think toxic fandom was the one to go for, and I've got a few reasons for this. For a start, uh, let's, let's talk about how it was raised. The motivation of the killers in Scream 5 is toxic fandom. They are stab super fans who feel that the series has gone astray, has gone into terrible, uh, terrible directions, but especially in Stab 8, directed by Ryan Johnson. They have a fun little way of talking around it, but they do identify Ryan Johnson is the guy who made Stab 8, so it's an obvious uh, comparison to the reaction to The Last Jedi. Okay, remember the Stab movie that came out last year? Oh, yeah, the one the Knives Out guy directed, right? No, I actually really liked that one. Of course you did. You have terrible taste. So Scream 5's killers Richie and Amber, the Stab superfans, decide to redirect, uh, reboot the Stab series, by giving them a fresh wave of killings and uh, deaths of legacy characters to draw off so that the series will return to form. Um, that is the example of toxic fandom. That's how they raise it in the movie. And uh, yeah, I have some problems with that. Uh, it, On its own terms, it shoots itself in the foot, but we'll get into that. The first thing we should ask is, how do we know what toxic fandom is? Scream 5 uh, will raise it, but they won't give you a definition. They just give you an extreme example, a very hyperbolic example of toxic fans. And I feel that is unfair, but also characteristic of what goes on in the discourse around that. That is the official channels of movie studios and the shill media. They give you uh, effectively a Mott and Bailey game of toxic fandom. That is... When they want to stress how serious an issue it is, they will point to isolated incidents of what they call harassment, uh, people saying really horrible things online to studios, to actors, um, getting very aggressive and abusive over decisions in the media, or even just casting choices. And fair enough, that's not good. It's not civilised, it's not polite, it's not behaviour you'd be proud of, and you shouldn't do it. Um, that is the extreme end that they love to point to. That is the solid, defensible definition when you say toxic fandom is a problem. However, having established that, they then like to play the, the Bailey game, which is where they really like to uh, put the people that they can't condemn as fairly. They point to review YouTube people like Critical Drinker, Mauler, uh, Heel vs. Babyface, Clipped Coin. Those would be the kind of people who do considered feisty, frank critiques that are 
objectively good criticism, going into the details, calling out terrible writing, terrible casting, terrible decisions, and obvious agenda pushing, obvious sort of, I would say, quite toxic agenda pushing that studios are engaged in. They talk about it in a very frank manner and they do very considered analysis. It's the kind of thing that I'm trying to do here. You know, um, it doesn't make you popular to, well, it certainly doesn't make me popular talking in the way I do about movies. It's, I think, rare to get ahead if you aren't producing sort of under 10 minute shill pieces where you just say something is fantastic. I digress, I got a little waylaid there, sorry. But effectively, what I want to say is, studios like to call it toxic fandom when their trash films and obnoxious agitprop gets called out by serious reviewers. And the toxicity is just a cover. The actual bad behavior, which obviously deplore, do not like, disavow, um, that's just a cover for them. They like to lump it all together under toxic fandom. You know, effectively they're saying when they do this, shut up and watch your slot peasant. I have a big problem with this and that's why I think toxic fandom was kind of a poor choice here, especially because of how Screen 5 attempted to handle it. It really didn't go in depth, it really didn't have a lot to say, other than saying it's kind of a problem and doing something very um, on side with the studios in a really blunt way. But even at that, Scream 5 failed. So it failed in its own universe, in its own logic, because what they show you from Stab 8 is terrible. This is a deep problem in their treatment of the toxic fandom discourse. They have made it very clear that the Stab series is in decline, that Stab 8, with the footage that they themselves shot, is a terrible movie, as cute as it is that we got Matthew Lillard putting on the golden ghost face mask and using a flamethrower, that is a lovely bit of trivia. However, ultimately they're proving that Richie and Amber are correct. Stab 8 is an atrocity, it's terrible, it's trash, and them hating it is justified. But the logical problems go even further than this, because Richie and Amber's plan is a synecdoche of what the filmmakers for Scream 5 are doing themselves. That is, Richie and Amber return to Woodsboro, go back to the grounded beginnings, and go back to the legacy characters to restart it on firmer ground, right? Which is, of course, what the filmmakers of Scream 5 did. They went back to Woodsboro themselves, they brought in the legacy characters, they are doing the exact same thing. So, for Richie and Amber's plan to fail, they need to be making a terrible movie. Scream 5 needs to be a terrible movie, and the story choice needs to be terrible for them to be right. This is a key flaw in how they handled the theme of toxic fandom, and therefore it doesn't ruin the movie, but it makes the message, the theme, very weak. I still think it doesn't derail uh, Scream 5, but it does mean that it's sort of, uh, how can we say, its value as a commentary on the horror world is very diminished. So given the failure to handle the topic of Scream 5, and given that we had the same filmmakers, the same screenwriters and directors for Scream 6, you can understand why I wasn't exactly optimistic about how they were going to handle the topic of franchises. And I'm gonna say, they didn't do a good job. A lot of the things you could say about franchises have already been covered by Scream 2 when it addressed sequels, and I think that's partly why Scream 3 completely sidestepped the discussion of sequels and franchises and trilogies and focused most of its attention on the rather dark secret world of the casting couch, which obviously is much more of an open secret these days. Um, Scream 4 obviously highlighted the problem of franchise decline, even though it wasn't the main topic. And so there's not too much that Scream 6 could say. And you have to wonder what was it really saying? Was it kind of just reheating Scream 2's leftovers here? And having watched Scream 6 three times, I'm not even sure what they're trying to say about franchises. When I look at the cinema full of memorabilia, I wonder if they're trying to say that the series just end up attracting too much baggage that weighs it down with expectations. You know, you you expect uh, Sam to be the new Billy and that's a, that's a failure. I mean, at the same time, they do say that Chad is the new Dewey, so... Bit of a contradiction there. 
Um, you might say it's baggage. I would say that franchises have deep lore that if you're a good writer, you can draw from to make a creative story. If by rehashing a lot of Scream 2's elements, they're talking about how franchises end up in self-cannibalizing spirals where they don't have new ideas and they just reuse old stuff. Again, might it's not a particularly novel criticism. And also the problem is that they are doing the thing they are criticizing, which makes it kind of a weak critique. Uh, the strength, as I've said with Scream, is it can always point at the problem and then do something better. That's what makes it a wonderful in-genre critique. Are they saying that the history of franchises is outdated and it belongs in effectively a dusty old museum? Is that what they're trying to say? It could be that. Is it saying we should just uh, ditch the law and embrace a new thing? Possibly. When Sam just discards the uh, original Scream's ghost face mask, the original Billy mask at the end, is that saying you just want to chuck away the old stuff and embrace the new stuff? Rather cynically, I think it might be. And uh, I sort of have problems with that. When you see this subway absolutely packed full of uh, iconic horror characters, are they trying to say that we're basically overcrowded with franchises? That actually is a nice way of making the criticism, even if it's not particularly original. Um, but I'm not sure that's even what they're saying. I just, as with Scream 5, I get a muddle. The theme may be franchises, but it is not expressed in a way that you can really draw anything from. If they really had a problem with franchises, should they even be doing Scream 6? It's a fair old question. So there's a lot that they could be saying about franchises here, but as with Scream 5, I'm not sure what it is. It's not clear to me. I'm not saying I want a, a character to just get up on a soapbox and deliver a speech to me about it, but I would like to think that it's something that we can pick out as something that has a clear idea behind it that is expressed clearly. Even if the ideas aren't particularly new, you can express them in an interesting way. And so I thought I would, uh, I would take a risk. I would try and give my own fix for how I would address the topic of franchises in a creative and original way for Scream 6 if I were to be a writer. Obviously, I'm not. Uh, I'm a novice. I'm just a confirmed ghost story and horror film addict. And I might bungle this, but you know what? I'll, I'll give it a go with my own fix. Uh, naturally, I'm worried if I do it alone, but who really cares? It's your life. You never know. It could be great. You gotta take a chance because you might grow. So I want you to imagine that when we find out who the killer is, it could very much be uh, in the traditional model that we don't find out until the end. What I would like to get is that it's someone they don't know, someone really peripheral to the story that we've seen only a few times, someone who is absolutely not in the inner circle, someone who really has nothing to do with them. That's who I think the killer should be. I want them to have gone along the usual scream route, get involved with the police, see the suspects, and have the police effectively say to them, there are so many, uh, so many deaths in New York, um, we can't devote as much time to you. You're kind of small pictures, uh, how can I say, small potatoes compared to the general crime level. That's going to be the backdrop. They can highlight some horrific killings that they've seen recently and effectively ask the Scream cast, what makes you think your case is so special? Why do you deserve all this attention? What? It's a ghost face killing? Why didn't you say? And that's the key to it. When we find out the killer, we should find out that that killer had done the previously mentioned murders, the ones that are creative and nasty, but they're new. And because of that, they didn't get the attention. And therefore the killer feels he has to become Ghostface in order to get anyone to pay attention to him. He actually doesn't care about movies. You know, he doesn't give a hoot about horror movies. He doesn't give a hoot about the screencast. But he knows that joining the Ghostface brand joining the Ghostface franchise, that's the only way anyone will pay any attention to him. That's how you would convey the message. In addressing the topic of franchises that way, what I'm symbolizing is that it's really hard for original stories to get out there to get attention because people naturally want to follow the franchises. Studios naturally want to follow the franchises. 
Uh, and it's very common, actually. The guy who was going to take over Scream 7 previously, so much of his work was in the Paranormal Activity series. He's done about five of them, I think. Uh, and Christopher Landon also did the Happy Death Day series, uh, which they're trying to make a third one for. It's so easy to just get sucked into doing a franchise. Uh, Darren Lynn Boseman was trying to be an original writer. He wrote a script that would later become Saw 2 because he couldn't get it made as an original project. It had to be brought into the Saw franchise to get attention. I think very much the same thing happened with Spiral. I don't believe that movie had anything to do with Saw originally, but they said, look, if you want to make your uh, A cab anti-cop movie, we want to tie it into something a bit more marketable. So Spiral is going to become Spiral from the Book of Saw. It is very much something that happens. I think we could symbolically address that by having the killer approach things this way. I think it would also provide room for Scream 6 to do that in-genre critique where they could be looking for suspects in kind of ridiculous places. They could be looking for outrageous explanations for who the killer is, you know, the kind of long lost relative, kind of uh, cults or something, something quite extreme, even flirt with the supernatural, as uh, Randy in Scream 3 warned them you probably have to do when you go beyond three. Um, you could do that and then have the reality be a lot more mundane. That would be a kind of in-genre critique. Point to the problem, do something better. So that is how I would address the topic of franchises. I think it would be something new. It would be something we hadn't seen before. That was a tautology. I've been filming for quite a while, guys. Um, and it would, I think, say something about franchises in a creative way. Uh, so that's how I would do that. So moving on to that and staying within the idea of wasted premises, I want to talk about how Scream 6 handles urban horror, which is a, a very interesting thing, but also very challenging to do. One of the things about the urban environment is you don't get that isolation that you get in the suburb. You actually have people all around you, and that really challenges one of these central things you'd do in horror. You isolate someone, they're on their own, they can't get help, and that's how they get picked off. They, it really does come down to them with no support from their community. And that speaks to very sort of primal fears we have about being isolated, about being cast out, about not being within a community with support from people. Friday the 13th, part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan, dodges the issue of urban horror. It gives you a couple of the superficial elements, like a scene with Jason on the subway, or this brief bit in a famous location with this weird little guy who is gonna be the main detail you remember from that movie from now on. Or maybe this punch as well, that was pretty darn fun. Um, but basically, it just redid Friday the 13th in the big city. It. Uh, shoved you in some landmarks and then isolated you so you could do the usual thing. It was dodging urban horror as, a, I suppose, a mode. Now, I think Scream 6 also mishandles urban horror in its own way, uh, but this is a lot more subjective. I think probably a lot of you are going to disagree with me on this one, and that's absolutely fine because this is based on my perspective of the city, what it's like living in that environment, uh, my own preferences. So. Um, this is a much more of a personal take about the premise of urban horror. But what I would say is the key to urban horror is acknowledging that you can't do the isolation that you have in typical horror, where someone goes off into the woods or they're, um, you know, in a fairly sparsely populated suburb or they're off in a castle, you know, a strange environment. You have to fully accept the problem of the uh, lack of isolation, actually, the overcrowding, that has to be your problem. Zombie movies would work really well in an urban environment because crowding and being uh, sort of claustrophobically overwhelmed by the population density is a natural part of a zombie movie and an unavoidable problem of a city. In short, urban horror needs to actually reflect the horrific urban conditions and draw from it. I think two films that did this really well were Jacob's Ladder and Seven. They really captured it. They were really good at locating urban horror in showing how the city brings you in proximity to people who've fallen very, very far down the cracks, people who've fallen very far from humanity. 
um, I will I will struggle phrasing this and it's a delicate issue so please please do use a charitable reading of what I'm about to say. In Jacob's Ladder when you have that early scene on the subway uh, our protagonist encounters a woman who is very bloated, very disheveled, she's a tramp, uh, she cannot speak English, uh, he can't communicate with her and he later sees that she has a tail, uh, she is a sort of disfigured, dismonic, demonic, she is a disfigured, dismonic creature, oh dear, she is a disfigured, demonic creature and he just can't relate to her, he's horrified by, by her, she is a horrifying sight. She is also just a kind of exaggeration of what you can see in the city. Right now on screen, let's flip to something not trying to be a horror film, Larry Clark's Kids. This will sound very insensitive, but what Jacob's Ladder was showing with the woman is a reflection of this chap you're seeing on the subway in Kids. You're seeing someone who has really fallen down the cracks and is in a very poor condition that you cannot escape from it. It's very telling that urban horror does go to the trains a lot. Uh, Jacob's Ladder, uh, Creep, uh, uh, there are other ones I'm afraid, I've been recording a long time. They like to use the subway because of the um, and the fact that you're packed in, so there's that overcrowding, but there's also the inability to escape is part of it. You can't really find your people, you can't find your community, you can't really escape this proximity to horror in the urban environment. Films like Creep, Jacob's Ladder and Seven, they do a really good job of showing how far people can fall in supposedly civilised city, just how uncivilised it can get. They show cities as labyrinths where people get lost in the depths and in the cracks and a natural environment where we lose our nature. Towards the end of my time in London, I was walking through the theatre district, the uh, Shaftesbury Avenue, I'm fairly well known, and begging on the street was a woman who I believe was probably Turkish uh, from her appearance, who was horrifically disfigured. Um, she had obviously been burnt with acid and she had a lot of facial scarring. Her nose was cut off, um, like literally you just saw the nostrils. She'll have been through something horrific and painful and uh, just an absolutely awful experience. And she's just been made to sit in daylight begging in London in a foreign country. And from experience, from knowledge of uh, particularly Germany where you see this, it's most likely this woman uh, was part of a gang. She was being controlled by most likely a Turkish or Albanian gang where she's been disfigured and made to beg and give her earnings to them with the disfigurement being a sort of extra incentive for people to take pity on her. She's got a horrible situation, she's got a horrible life and she will have suffered something atrocious that I can't even imagine and so it it feels very it feels incredibly selfish and narcissistic to say oh gosh I was so horrified by what I saw there but um being honest I was I thought it's very jarring to live in what's meant to be a first world civilized country and see evidence of such barbarity and such crime uh, such horror right amongst you uh, one of many such sites that I saw in London. I feel that's part of the essence of urban horror that Scream 6 did not go near. Uh, I think it's too politically insensitive for one. The other aspect that I really want to touch on is the response to uh, when you can't isolate people for horror. Um, and that is that the other horror of urban horror is apathy. It's the disconnection with people. They are there, but you are disconnected from them. Um, and that is something the filmmakers actually dispute. They disagree with me. On the commentary, talking about this pivotal subway scene that was so good that they decided it had to be in the trailer, and it is a good scene, they specifically argued against my assumption, which is that people wouldn't, wouldn't help 
when Mindy is isolated on the train, uh, which is absolutely packed with people wearing horror regalia, and she's stabbed, it's right out in the open. As much as they try and hide it and give excuses for why people cannot respond, why they don't care, um, the thing is that people ignore it. And the filmmakers, I think, did not want to address this. They, they didn't feel comfortable uh, addressing it. This is what they said. Also, I do want to say, like, it's not, there's, because I saw some stuff about, like, the, it's New York where nobody cares. And I'm like, no, that's actually not how New York works. People do care. Yeah. And, like, yeah. mm -hmm. like, New Yorkers frequently try and help our characters through, like, mm -hmm. the well, store think, clerk, the people here, like. And it's Halloween specifically, we think, that is, like, the vital ingredient in this yeah. scene. Because it's one of those holidays that I think gives people permission. Like, you can get away with more because of how crazy the holiday is and I, that was such a vital ingredient in this feeling the way that it feels. And this is much more of a personal view but I really disagree with them. I do think apathy is a problem. You know, um, when you're in an urban environment you see so many horrific things and you're around frankly so many dangerous people that you have no connection to. You have to learn to be apathetic. You have to learn to not get involved. And that is what we see. I remember one time I was with a, a friend of mine. We went to pick up his cousin. She lived on a farm in New Hampshire her whole life. She had never been to any city before. And we're picking her up at the Port Authority, <laughs> that smelly hole of a place. And we pick her up there and she's just freaking out at New York. She's never seen anything like it. And we pass this homeless guy and she sees him. I mean, we all passed him, but she saw him. <laughs> she's the only one who actually Saw him. And this dude was particularly homeless. He was one of those high octane, homeless, smelly, just piss smell. The unbelievable piss smell. Just, so he was pissed. He didn't just smell like piss. He was, when you piss, he comes out. That's what, that's how much. And again, me and my friend were just like, meh. His cousin immediately just gets, she's like, oh my God. She takes a knee. She goes, oh my God, sir, are you okay? What happened? And me and my friend, we're from New York, this is the crazy part. We immediately go to her, oh no, 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 honey, don't. Uh... We start correcting her behavior like she's doing something wrong. She's like, why is he okay? No, no, he needs you desperately. That's not the point. We just don't do that here. You <laughs> like silly country girl. <laughs> the filmmakers can say what they said, but realistically, when we see the news stories come out about, uh, I'm gonna have to speak in YouTube code here, about uh, a chap violating a woman on a train and no one intervening and just filming it, just doing that in broad daylight, that is the horror of the urban environment. A scene like this of uh, horrific uh, abuse of a racial character then turning into um, racial violence that is urban horror and people you notice do not get involved here and recent events and try not to make this super political but recent events in response to people who do get involved who do try and help passengers really does show you that uh, it's unlikely that people are going to get involved and intervene that for me is the other key part of the urban horror that they didn't go near, that they specifically wanted to avoid, which is that you may be surrounded by people, but you are on your own. That is the urban horror that they should have tapped into. That was that was quite a heavy section. We're, we're lighter on this. I mean, I'm still going to critique the film, but the next section, it, it's lighter. We're going to talk about how the film absolutely bodges its handling of characters, particularly Gail. She's like, why is he okay? No, no, he needs you desperately. That's not the point. We just don't do that here. <laughs> you like, silly country girl. <laughs> This wouldn't be a comprehensive analysis of Scream 6 if I didn't mention the absolute bodge job that was done on character development and character arc in this film. Most of all to Gail Weathers, but we will get to her in a bit. Now, 
You might not expect character development and character arcs to be particularly prominent, particularly well developed in a horror series, but you know, Scream is always meant to be a cut above everything else. And so gosh darn it, I'm going to hold it to a higher standard. And frankly, in the past, we saw a higher standard in the Scream universe. Sidney Prescott's original journey is a really good character arc. In Scream 1, she's naive but traumatised and goes through a really bad experience that leaves her in Scream 2 more aggressive, more paranoid, more defensive, and really struggling to trust anyone. And so by the time she goes to Scream 3, she has really shut herself off from the world even more. She knows she wants to help, but she's far too bothered by her past. And we literally see her then in that film go back to the beginning, work through the trauma, address the issues, and integrate that into a sort of more mature, more developed self in which she is using that trauma to inform who she is and who she wants to help. At the end, having done this, she can finally let down the barriers, as we're shown symbolically in the end, and be more open to the world. This is a good character arc. It's, um, it's just an absolute bonus that Scream 5 shows us she's married, she's had children. She is in a good place now. That is lovely. In Scream 5, uh, you know, the events of that we expect, we expect that to impact on people. Sam and Tara of the new cast, they are, well, it's, they get a little bit. As a result of Scream 5, Tara is running a bit wild now. She's kind of irresponsible, having faced danger, faced a really traumatic experience. She's literally bearing the scars, which we still see on her hand in a nice touch. And Sam, in response to this, becomes overprotective of Tara. After being sort of very distant from her and causing tension that way in Scream 5, she comes back into her life and she's actually overprotective. That is a nice bit of character development. I like it. I'm not going to really comment on the uh, the Dark Sam, the killer in me idea. I'm not really into it, but it is at least there and developed a bit. However, what else do we see? Tara is given a love interest in Chad that kind of comes out of nowhere, given that they really didn't interact with each other much at all in Scream. Uh, Scream 5, I should say. It's it's weird that they released it as just Scream 2022. It always throws me off. It's fascinating, too, because doing interviews and stuff like that, like, there are people who literally don't believe us. They're like, yeah, 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 but, like, you set some stuff up for 6, right? Because obviously you set up the Tara and Chad romance. We're like, no. We didn't do any, any work that, with that at all. So, yeah, the, uh, the Chad and Tara relationship was an early uh, yeah. decision, and, you know, it's kind of a swing. You're like, well, we hope we hope this works, but it's like these two people are so charismatic, yeah. they could have chemistry with a wall. What's crazy is I think they only have one scene together in five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just in the hospital. Yep, right. that first I think yeah. literally yeah. their scene. And I don't think they talk to each other in the scene. Nope. No. no. Technically, so. they're in the final scene together. He's in the... That's true. <laughs> I also don't think they <laughs> talk to each other in the final scene. When they're, when they're, they're both, both on stretchers? Stretchers yeah. with uh, <laughs> oxygen. Uh, it's maybe embarrassing how long I've wanted to do that. Yeah, you should have done that a lot sooner. No. We didn't do any, any work with that? that at all. I also feel like with Tara, they kind of abandoned the idea that she was more into Amber. She was probably bisexual. Um, it's just a hint. It's not something they did much with. But I feel like that just got chucked into the long grass in, in favour of this pairing that really, you know, doesn't have much basis to it. It seems to stem pretty much from the fact that Chad comes in and rescues her from a drunken hookup, and then they go back so they can have a drunken hookup. Right. Look, you already know consistency isn't big in this film. I'm sure it's all very ESG compliant, but uh, I'm not convinced by it. I'm not invested in it. I don't care about this romance at all. Otherwise for Chad, well, he, he doesn't get much uh, in terms of development. I don't think he actually goes anywhere. He was really horribly treated in Scream 5. In contrast to Dewey, who uh, who he has a lot in common with, the commentary even calls him the new Dewey, he comes out of Scream 5 kind of scar-free. There's no limp, even though he was stabbed brutally. You really wouldn't know that anything happened to him in Scream 5. And a similar thing happens with Mindy. She, I would say, gets an even worse treatment Whereas Chad just seems neutral in development, no development. 
With Mindy, I think we see anti-growth. See, Chad and Mindy are really likable in Scream 5. Randy was our uncle. R.I.P. You can tut about why they are the way they are, but personally, I found them likable. They were fine. Mindy is bisexual or gay, probably gay by the time of this film, but from what we see. And she wears in Scream 5 a little indicator that she is on board with the message. It's very obvious why it's in there, but I wouldn't say it's overstated or hugely objectionable. They're going to do their thing. However, by the time she gets to Scream 6, Mindy is now just a walking billboard for pride. She has been flanderized. That is, a small aspect of her character has been blown up out of all proportion to almost define her, and the nuances have dropped away. There was a lot of really wonderful dark, sick humour about her in Scream 5 that I found really interesting. The fact that she enjoyed watching a movie based on her uncle dying and said she found it comforting. I thought that was sick and twisted in the best way, and I found her a really interesting character. That is pretty much gone in Scream 6, but instead, all we have is... THE MESSAGE! Everything she wears is the message. Every outfit contains a statement in favour of whatever, LGBTQIA plus stuff. Her jacket is absolutely festooned with intersectionality advancement identifiers. It's... It feels parodic. It feels like this is how you do a parody of someone into that stuff. But it's played absolutely straight. I mean, I, I guess the only thing is they didn't dye her hair, but that's the only thing they didn't do. The Mindy we get in this film really doesn't feel like the Mindy we knew in Scream 5, and that is a terrible shame. Watch out, Jamie. You know he's around. You know... What? There he is. Come on, man, turn around! Turn you. around, turn around. Dude. I find it so disappointing because what we saw of them in Scream 5 was so likeable and I felt there was so much more to uncover, especially because of that link to a character we already love, Randy. For instance, we saw a really interesting glimpse inside their household in the uh, Randy's uh, Memorial Theatre. We got to see the mother briefly, Martha was there in a little cameo, but that's kind of all we know of them that brief glimpse of their home, we didn't even see their father. What I'm saying is there's room for development, and hopefully in Scream 7 we will get some of that. That is on you, Christopher Landon. Please make it happen. By far the most disrespected, ill-treated character in Scream 6 is Gail Weathers, and so she is who I'm going to focus on for the rest of this segment, because I think she's a bit of a microcosm for the rest of the character development and character arcs in this film. By the end of Scream 5, Gail has been through a heck of a lot, an actual huge amount. She has been shot, she has lost Dewey, uh, really the love of her life, and her relationship with Dewey does basically define her arc, just as she defines his arc in the Scream series. And she ends it on a moment of maturity and reflection. How are you doing? Ask me in a few days. But at least I know what I'm gonna write about. What's that? Not this. Those fuckers can die in anonymity. Maybe something about a good man who used to be the sheriff here once. I'd like to read that story. She comes onto the scene wanting to do her sort of cheap journalism shtick, but she drops it really quickly to genuinely invest herself in helping Sam and Tara. It is a good sign of maturity and growth. And at the end of the film, she's sworn off writing about Scream 5, the pattern that she's done previously for the last whole bunch of films. And she's decided that what she's going to do instead is something positive. She's going to use her skills to write a tribute to Dewey. It is a really lovely, poignant end to her arc. And so naturally in Scream 6, they slapped the reset button, said, screw it, we're going to do a factory reset on Gail. We're taking her back 
to Scream, the original, she's going to go back in a tacky suit, write a tacky book and get punched in the face for it. Oh. Nice try, sweetie. But I've done this dance before. Oh. Because you like that. It's a payoff. It's fan service, right? We like fan service. Do you remember the thing? You like a member, Barry. We're going to do that for Gail. Dance before. Oh. It is cheap. It is insulting. And I was annoyed with it as I was watching it in the cinema. It is a complete reversal of the progress that she made in Scream 5. And it feels like there wasn't much thought into it. Why has Gail decided not to write the tribute to Dewey and instead write a tacky cash-in book that annoys Sam and Tara, just replaying the Scream plot line? Are you really still mad at me? You said you wouldn't write a book about what happened. And then you wrote a book about what happened. Oh, come on. Even more, you might think, how did she manage to research, write and publish a full book in a year? That seems a little stretched. It seems like they didn't really think about the timeline there. While she was researching this book, did she not learn about Richie's family? Surely she did. That would seem quite relevant to the plot of the movie, but no, that uh, don't think about that. Don't think about that too long, guys. Don't activate your brain. Focus on the member berries. Oh. It gets worse from there. If uh, the reset to a sleazy journalist Gale isn't bad enough, we find out that uh, in the less than a year since she lost Dewey, Gail has got herself a uh, brand new big boyfriend living with her. Now, that might seem extremely callous, that might seem like jumping the gun, it might seem like it comes absolutely out of nowhere and is really inappropriate, but, okay, devil's advocate here. This guy who goes unnamed in the movie, uh, but is meant to be called Brooks, he may have been in the picture in Scream 5, in the years since Dewey left her, which I still think was kind of a shady move for them to throw on him, but we will skip over that. It's possible he was in the picture, but just unmentioned, unfocused on. Um, however, no one mentions him. It seems out of place. And in both Scream 5 and Scream 6, all anyone really focuses on is Gail's relationship with Dewey. Brooks really isn't there. He really doesn't seem relevant. He really isn't integrated into a new character. And it really, if I'm being honest, seems like he was popped in for the message. And also because maybe they thought it was a bit insulting to have him as a bodyguard. It just seems like that. He, he feels to me like a bodyguard who got bumped up to boyfriend, got a quick promotion when they were doing some rewrites. Maybe they shot a couple of versions where it was more explicitly bodyguardy. I don't know. Richie and Amber managed to butcher Dewey, carved him up like a Christmas goose. How does it feel to lose the only man who ever loved you? Ew. Brooks really doesn't seem integrated into Gail's life at all. And when he's taken out of it, conveniently, silently, I might notice in, in a scene that is pure cheating, there is no way she wouldn't have heard that instantly. When he's taken out, Ghostface taunts Gail saying this. Sorry about your boyfriend. All those muscles didn't help much. And Gail's response comes off as frankly sociopathic. I sure didn't. <laughs> That's a response that would make sense to me if Brooks was her bodyguard. But if he was her boyfriend, I think she'd be a little more devastated than that. But then this film also has Mindy laughing and joking after her girlfriend is gutted and dies brutally right in front of her. So maybe don't expect too much consistency from this film. Anyway, after Brooks is gutted and taken out of the picture conveniently silently, Ghostface goes on to mercilessly taunt Gail, chase her round, and luckily because she is a veteran at this point, uh, she knows exactly what to do. Close the door, open the drawer, everybody walk the dinosaur. She shoots at Ghostface, sees him off, but then is stabbed and luckily saved by Sam. Luckily, because it's Scream 6. No one dies. Literally, none of the main characters die. It, we'll get onto it. We'll get onto it. Incidentally, by the way, when Gail drops her gun, it disappears. It's meant to be dropped by this table here. But then when you see it, it's not there. And it only reappears when Sam comes into the picture and needs to pick it up. It's a little weird thing I noticed in the edit. 
again, uh, three watches in, I, you pick up these weird little details. It's a, it's a moment of sloppiness. Anyway, I really don't think that the directors wanted you to think of this. They didn't want to put much thought into it any more than they wanted to re-record this terrible line reading. That seemed intense. But they did have some debate over it in the filmmaker's commentary, and they effectively said, Gail's going to be Gail, that this really isn't her character, it's her essential nature, and therefore it's okay to do this complete reset. They have a little debate over whether she's evolved or not, and it's one of the most useful parts of the commentary, I would say, if you're really looking to understand what they're doing, apart from just getting snarky fun clips. The police station. This is low-key my favorite moment in the movie, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Missed punch. <and> then <laughs> I remember going, is this too much? But the Terra punches that were like, now this is pretty cool. I also, I really, you know, it's one of those things that like, I, I love that you guys did in the script where, you know, you leave the last movie with Gail being almost feeling like she's finally changed. Yes. And then starting this movie with, no, she hasn't. Yeah, well, I mean, the world's <laughs> gonna be Gail. And I yeah. think that I, I, look, I don't think it was, I think she was a very nice book in terms of Dewey. Like, I don't think it was, you know, but I think that there's something wonderful about, it's not that she hasn't changed, but you know, you are who you are. And the fact yeah. that she's unapologetically herself and a career woman and powerful and a journalist, like, She's gonna Gale's gonna Gale. And yeah, it gives her and Sam crazy. somewhere to go as yes. as characters. And we also post so important. Post Dewey's death, we didn't want to see her wallowing and being sad. And we there's this fun aspect of Gale, you know, being this ambitious and sort of driven yeah. person that that's not gonna go away. And I think she has evolved and that comes out in later scenes. I would like to dispute this. I think that's idea of saying, well, it's her essential nature is really a poor way of arguing that it's character arc, that it's uh, consistent, because you can be consistent with a character whilst they still evolve. For instance, uh, the idea that she still wants to write, she still wants to tell a story, but she wants to turn it to something positive in a tribute to Dewey, that is both consistent, it's Gale being Gale, and it's character evolution at the same time. I think you need a motivation for someone to lose all that uh, development, especially when it happens between films. You need some kind of justification. If they were to throw in a few lines of her saying she tried to sell the book and no one would take it, no one wants a feel good story, and therefore she had to go back and do the kind of hackneyed stuff that people knew her for, that would help. But there's nothing like that in here. And I think honestly, the filmmakers didn't think about it in as much depth. They sure didn't. I think realistically, they didn't know what to do with Gail, so they just slapped on the factory reset, thought they would get a cheap laugh out of this punching gag. They stab her, send her to hospital, and let the next film decide what to do with her, because as we know, they do not plan ahead. They said this in the commentary. It's fascinating too, because doing interviews and stuff like that, like there are people who literally don't believe us. They're like, yeah, 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 but like, you set some stuff up for six, right? Because obviously you set up the Tara and Chad romance. We're like, no, we didn't do any, any work for that at all. They didn't want to risk developing her. They didn't want to risk letting her grow after the Dewey arc. And they didn't even want to risk killing her. It's just like the pre-title sequence. Scream 6 had a chance to do something interesting and they bottled it. They were too scared to do anything risky. All I'm saying at this point is, take a chance, you stupid hoe, rough film. What are you waiting for? This penultimate segment is going to be a really quick one in which we discuss the delicious and frustrating irony that Scream 6 is way too scared. Not scary, scared. They are too scared to take big risks in all sorts of areas. Now we've already touched on a couple of them, the fact that they had this really excited, uh, sorry, really exciting genre bending twist at the start where we'd know who the killer was from the very beginning and they bottled it, resulting in huge plot problems. We've also discussed about how none of the characters die. Loads of them get stabbed, all of them live. Um, I don't think I've really spelled that out, but let's be clear. Chad stabbed a whole ton. Tara stabbed in the back kind of seems to forget about it after a few minutes, just as the screenwriters hope you will. 
Uh, Mindy is stabbed and lived. Kirby is stabbed and lives. Uh, I think Sam is the only one who doesn't get a, a major wound and Gail, of course, is stabbed and lives. They bottled it. They didn't take any risk. And they have tried to defend this. Mindy does her big speech in the university and she says that as it's a, uh, a requel, a sequel to a requel, basically no one is safe. Legacy characters can get it too. Rule two. Whatever happened last time, expect the opposite. Franchises only survive by subverting expectations. And rule three, no one is safe. Legacy characters, cannon fodder at this point. Usually brought back only to be killed off in some cheap bid for nostalgia. I don't know if she's thinking of herself as a legacy character at this point, however. All right, so we like to stab Chad. I yeah, feel like not as a count. group, we need to own that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do not count. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, he's, and he's I, become I, the new Dewey. I, the new Dewey. Well, yeah. I, I just do remember through the editing process, people going, he can't live. Like, he can't. <laughs> and so to the point where we digitally removed we stabs. VFX the yeah. yeah. I think it was 14 stabs in the original. Original, yeah. That, and it's, now it's down to like seven. It was the wind would that whistle was by him every time right? he walked. <laughs> and Mason in that scene, I mean, he was, he's so great in the whole movie, but he gave so much in that scene. That was actually like really hard to shoot. Yeah. It doesn't matter because no one dies. They chickened out. They try and sell this as a twist on a twist. And there's something so fun in that the movie, the movie is a twist on itself. That Mindy's, the thing that Mindy gets like, The wrong, twist on a twist. twist, on yeah. a twist. Is, that, is that everyone's <laughs> like, spendable? Yeah. Exactly. But doesn't, doesn't seem like to me that comes out as the same as normal. If you twist on a twist, you've produced the normal thing. So I am not particularly convinced by that argument. I think what it looks like a lot more is they played it safe. They were too cowardly to kill off a character that they thought people liked. And it is particularly ridiculous in the case of Chad. He is pincushioned. He is Swiss cheesed in this double attack. And then he is absolutely fine for some reason. The the paramedics think uh, Tara should pause his very urgently needed medical treatment to smooch him for a bit. It's it's very movie logic. It doesn't belong in Scream. Also, a um, side note, I think it was really cheap how they used the double killer uh, sequence here. That was kind of something that they had in the chamber for a while. That was a special, special card they could have played a while ago. And Ever since, I should mention, that idea of two ghost faces on screen at once uh, first showed up in the script for Screen 2. They ultimately didn't go with it, but it was clearly an idea they'd been thinking of for a while. Personally, I would have liked to see it when Dewey was killed. I don't know how long I'm... If I cut now, I've removed a massive tangent, but I'm just going to go into it while it's fresh in my head. People had complaints about Dewey's death in Scream 5 because... It relied on a certain contrivance uh, that he wouldn't just take advantage of the moment, shoot Ghostface in the head a whole bunch. The, the, the logistics of how Ghostface manages to overcome him and stab him, it feels like cheating. A lot of people were annoyed, especially when you realise in retrospect that it's a really tiny person who's meant to overcome him, and yet the Ghostface is the same height. You start to have these little niggles about it. Personally, I think the moment to use that double ghost face on screen, that was when Dewey died. That gives him a real send off. It you allow him to make no mistakes in taking on Ghostface. He could be doing everything right, keeping his distance from Ghostface, staying out of stab range, and then stabbed by another one coming in from behind. Something that hadn't happened before, something he wasn't expecting. And the fact that you would need two ghost faces to take him out kind of pays a bit of respect to the character. It really uh, references, it works with the logic of how special he is, that he can't be taken out by any common or garden ghost face. So that's when I wish they would have used the double ghost face idea. However, they use it on Chad and Chad lives. So it really feels that as cool a moment as this is, as as big a shiny coin as this was to wave in front of you. It doesn't really work, does it? It was kind of pointless. It just looked cool. Anyway, back to uh, how this film 
absolutely wusses out of anything risky. <laughs> Let's talk about Kirby. We know from Scream 5 that they wanted to bring her back, but weren't sure how to do it. And the solution for it in Scream 6 is this. Can I help you? Special Agent Kirby Reed, FBI. Yes, Kirby comes back as an FBI agent. It is crazy. They hang a lampshade on it by having Gail make a fun joke about how she's a fetus. It's a nice line. But nevertheless, it is a move into campness. And the move into campness is a particular risk for a horror film because it's effectively communicating to you, don't take us seriously, um, don't really invest. That move works for other horror film series, but it's not meant to work for Scream. They did it in Scream 3 to an extent, and Scream 3 is extremely controversial among fans because the tone is so off from every other movie. I view this move to campness as a sort of preemptive, ironic deflection of criticism. The fact that they're obviously winking at you. I mean, it's kind of a defense, but saying, well, I'm just silly, don't take me seriously. It doesn't feel worthy of Scream. I, fe I feel it's another form of cowardice. And I really worry that the new director of Scream 7 is also going to follow on with that trend. So I'm not going to spend much more time on this at all. We're going to move on from that because the biggest area of cowardice in Scream 6 is one that's a little bit hard to talk about. It's the choice of topic, or rather what they chose not to address. They could have done a current day topic like Scream 5 did, even if it was a bit inept in how it covered toxic fandom. But instead, they went back to an overplayed, kind of overdone topic of franchises. And realistically, there was one thing that they needed to talk about, but they didn't, because it's a trend in movies that Scream 6 is also doing. That is, wokeification of movies, making the movies... Uh, a vehicle for a very obvious prominent intersectional agenda. The message. This isn't something I like talking about. It is so easy to mess your words up. It is so easy to give the wrong impression and I really do not want to do so that. So I, I do try and avoid talking about it, but Scream 6 bottled it on that one. I'm not going to. The wokeification of movies is an obvious trend. I. If you need me to spell it out for you, you are clearly being a hatchling. We are not going to waste time with that. We are going to step over that game. For why Scream 6 is woke, I shouldn't have to argue it, but let's just put it out here. We have little things like Mindy becoming basically a walking billboard for pride. Uh, we have the fact that all of the core four are non-white. In contrast to Gail, Sydney, Dewey and Randy, every single one of them is non-white it's hard to think that that is an accident. And then, then there is the, uh, how can we say, the biggest one. The fact that all the killers are white. Now this happened in Scream 5 as well. There was a really good video by uh, Sean Fitzgerald, Actual Justice Warrior, a channel I really like, and who did a really good video on Scream 6, and you should watch it. I think I'll link it below. And he talked about how when you know the film has a very obvious agenda, it becomes predictable. And so you can just take a guess that the killers are going to be white. And it turns out that that's a really good heuristic for guessing what's going to happen in this film. With Scream 6, knowing what they did in Scream 5, I was tempted to just apply this heuristic again. And it is disappointing that it works. Of the new characters, the three killers, all of them are white, and yes, they are a family, so uh, I guess it's more likely that they would share the same demographic, but is, is that really the reason they're all white, or is it just very convenient for the agenda that the film is pushing? Again, I really hate talking about this. I really hate thinking about it, but it's kind of hard to ignore. And it is not just the killers, it is every character in Scream 6 that you are meant to hate is white. There is the guy referred to as Date Rape Frankie, uh, held to a very obvious double standard. Uh, drunken hookups with Tara for him, no bueno. But Chad, it's all gravy. Holy shit, it's that psycho girl! Then there is the girl who chucks soda on Sam in the park. 
Uh, it's claimed to be Diet Cherry Coke, but clearly it's clear it's probably Sprite. This is the minor detail. I shouldn't focus on it. There is the uh, very unfair therapist who bites it. There is also this random guy in the bodega who is very uh, rude to Samantara when they need help and then dies brutally. Also white. I feel, I'm feeling like Humza Yusuf here. I don't like noticing this, but it is kind of hard to ignore. And it is a very obvious aspect of Scream 6 that they did and were too scared to mention. The wokeness in movies, the very obvious agenda pushing, is the big trend at the moment. And the fact that Scream 6 not only refused to comment on it, but uncritically replicated it, is a sign that it has absolutely lost its way and frankly, doesn't belong in the Scream series. It is a sign of cowardice. They stuck with the message. They didn't critique what was going on. It is, it's messed up. I know, it, it's so messed up how society all thinks. <sighs> in addition to the problem of the movie basically saying that it hates me, um, there is that predictability. I'm really hoping that Scream 7 doesn't go down this line, but based on uh, the director's film, Happy Death Day to You, I don't have much faith in that. So that is, that is the aspect of Scream 6 being too afraid on many levels. And with that, we move into the final segment. Thanks for sticking with me, if you did. If you didn't, how are you seeing this? Next segment. Real stab movies are meta slasher whodunits, full stop. The exact words of the text. But do you understand it? Do you believe it? These last two segments are all about the failure of Scream 6 to capture the spirit of Scream, to understand the metaphysics of Scream, the purpose of Scream. The cowardice is a really obvious one, the fact that they wouldn't do the job that they needed to do in commenting on the thing they needed to comment on is an obvious way of seeing that they've lost their way. But there are plenty of other signals that they just do not understand Scream in this. I, I hate to say it when they really did Before such a good job of Scream 5, we, but in Scream 6, it scream really doesn't feel like a Scream movie. Yeah, As I even say in the commentary. About these people in college. It, it's, it's one of my favorite runs of the movie. From yeah. here to when, you know, the Danny Sam scene. Yeah. I'm going to go for a number of instances of this. This Mindy and Kirby scene is going to see gratuitous, but trust me for why I spend time on it. When you have the two horror geek characters, it's quite nice to see them interact. We've not really had a chance for that before. Each iteration has had their horror geek, whether it's Randy, Kirby, or Mindy. But them actually getting to interact and have a conversation about horror, that's an intriguing prospect that we haven't seen before. And so it's quite nice that Mindy and Kirby sit down and just chat about their favorite subgenre. I hear you're a horror fan. It's been said. Unfortunately, what they talk about is incredibly revealing. Best Nightmare on Elm Street. The, the original. original. I like that movie. It was scary. Wow, well, the first one was, but the rest sucks. Psycho 2 is underrated. underrated. Candyman. The original or equal? Both. Both. Okay. There are some respectable niche opinions that I approved of, like uh, singling out Tom Holland's Psycho 2 for praise. That's a really good choice. And by the way, it's a really good movie. You should watch it. And then there are things like saying their favorite Friday the 13th movie. Best Friday the 13th. Part the final two. Final chapter. Had a crush on Corey Feldman. Okay, respect. <laughs> now, two is a really weird one. The elements really aren't there. It's very janky. The ending is bad. It's really not regarded particularly highly. I mean, I could have a lot more respect for something like Three, which is the first time all the elements for Jason Voorhees come together, where he first gets a mask and his classic outfit. The elements really come together for the first time in Three. Um, I could also respect uh, Number Six, because it's the first time they went meta, and I could see that appealing to Mindy or even the more ambitious horror project of Seven, where they basically ripped off Carrie. 
but it, it really was an interesting direction for the series. But two? Two is a weird choice and we don't understand it. Four by Kirby is a very respectable choice, but what's her reason for it? It's it's not because it's the darkest one, it's not the most mature, it's not that it made a really good attempt to actually round off the series and probably I would say is the most scariest and most disturbing entry, the most accomplished. No, her, her justification for it is that she had a crush on one of the actors. I raised this because it shows an extremely superficial appreciation of horror, like someone just read the spark notes they just went for a quick Wikipedia overview of the topic, and it's really disappointing. I guess the fact that they both... <laughs> they ask whether the Candyman sequel or original is better, and both say both, which is maybe disappointing but predictable. Um, if you've seen my reviews, you'll know that Candyman is my favourite horror movie of all time, and I think the sequel is an abomination hijacking it for a political purpose, but we will not derail with that. I guess uh, them praising Jordan Peele again is perhaps to be expected after Scream 5. What's wrong with elevated horror? I mean, Jordan Peele fucking rules, uh, obviously. But regrettable takes on cinema aside, the bigger picture here is that Mindy's girlfriend was brutally murdered in front of her the day before, and now she's just kind of chilling again like she's completely forgotten about it. This is not Scream. Scream should not do this. This feels like a movie that is just using horror movie logic and not a movie in a real world where people are obsessed with horror movie logic. Mindy should be messed up now. She should not be laughing and joking. She should not be saying this kind of line. Okay. Okay. Game recognized game. The fact that this scene exists and is so focused on superficiality tells me that they've forgotten what film universe they're working in. They are not writing a Scream film. This this is maybe a bit trite to say, but it feels like they're making a stab film. You can see why I wanted to focus on that. It's a small thing, but it shows quite a revealing mistake in the creation of this film, in the, in the view that the uh, filmmakers approached it with. What I'm trying to say is just having references to other stuff, it's it's not enough. It doesn't show that you understand. You can reference something and not understand it. Early references to uh, uh, Friday the 13th Part 8 that uh, Jason and Samara Weaving's character, Laura Crane, make to uh, Jallo history. It's sort of, it feels like someone just read the Wikipedia but haven't really incorporated the knowledge. It's superficial. It's dropping a bit of trivia but not really showing true understanding. There are another couple of areas where Scream 6 shows that it doesn't understand the franchise, doesn't understand Wes Craven's vision. I'm gonna link them together since thematically they join up quite nicely. That is around the Wes Craven rule and the value of family. Now the Wes Craven rule, if you're not aware of it, is that when you're making horror, when you're showing these horrific things, these terrible things happening to people, you need to take it seriously and you need to treat those people as living, breathing, connected people who had families, who had friends, who are connected to communities. They shouldn't be cheap kills. Wes Craven did not want to make cheapy slasher films with a sense of nihilism where nothing matters. He made sure that when someone died, you knew it was a terrible thing. You can see that worldview across all his films. Think of how many of them center on families, on family tragedies, families trying to pull together through adversity, or families taking revenge when they lose one of their own, showing that the person who died was central to someone else's life, that they mattered. Going back to Scream, think of that opening. Think of how after you've seen Casey get killed, it's her family who find her, and see how devastated they are. You knew that Casey's loss was an absolute tragedy to some people. Think of Sydney and how much of the film focused on the tragedy of her losing her mother, how much her life was impacted by that, how she and her father were clearly still mourning, still affected by that loss. How about this? You're 
Just like mother was my father. And she's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me. How's that for a motive? I know what time it is, sir. It's after midnight. It's your mom's anniversary. Congratulations. We killed her exactly one year ago today. Attention. Oh, what do we have behind door number three, Sydney? Daddy! Whoa. This is the Wes Craven rule in action. Think of Scream 6. Think of how little we know about the killers at the start. Think of how little we know about Gail's brand new boyfriend. Didn't even get a name. You know it's Brooks, because I told you it was Brooks, but you wouldn't know that otherwise. All those muscles didn't help much. I sure didn't. Scream 6 was doing the killing of randomers in a way that clearly breaches the Wes Craven rule. It is showing they do not understand his worldview. They did such a good job, such an obvious job of making Scream 5 a tribute to him in a way that I found genuinely touching. And they understood the rule then. When you go into Dewey's trailer, you see that he has Tatum's ashes and a little memorial to her in there. You see the memorial to Randy. That is respecting the Wes Craven rule. And it really baffles me how the same creative team can completely forget that when they went into the sequel. And you could go further and say Scream 6 is almost antithetical to the Wes Craven rule, given how much anti-family messaging is in the movie. That is, you have the main killers are a family who are somewhat deranged. Uh, you have this scene where Sam and Gail discuss uh, their mothers. Where's your mother in all this? She cut me off when I told Tara about Billy. Then Tara cut her off because she wouldn't talk to me, so... Now neither of us have a mother. I'm sorry to say this, but fuck her. My parents suck too. This callous abandonment of the parental relationship and Gail's response to it being equally callous, it does not fit Wes Craven's vision. It is so anti-family. Scream is so built on the importance of mothers. Mothers are absolutely central to Scream. They are so important. Maureen Prescott is kind of a driving motivation through the first three movies. And so for Gail to just throw this total dismissal out there, that to me is not Scream. It does not fit. What it seems a lot more like is Scream 6, again, unthinkingly repeating the current day attitudes, not analysing them from the outside, like Wes Craven did. From listening to the filmmakers, you also see that they view the finale as a family v family uh, clash, in that they, uh, they view the core four as a family. And I've got to say, I do not go with that. The chosen family thing is very modern progressivism, it's not the same as a real family. Chad and Mindy, they are family. We have met their mother. That is an actual bond. But this core four thing, it is a good friendship group. It is a strong friendship group, but it is not family. If it's family, th th this macking out gets really creepy, all right? Think of that. Anyway, moving on. Another aspect that tells me they either didn't understand or didn't care about the spirit, the integrity of the Scream series, is a number of sort of shiny coin moments that they drop in throughout the film. These are things like Ghostface using a shotgun, or this moment here with the double ghost faces. Look at them, double ghost face. First time ever, we've never seen this before. Ooh. I really think they just expected a fanboy reaction from the audience about this with no critical thinking afterwards. And it strikes me as more than a little cynical, like they're thinking the average pleb audience member is going to be so overwhelmed and overjoyed by the hype of seeing two ghost faces on screen at once that they aren't going to stop to think, hey, hey, that, that ghost face just teleported out of nowhere to stab Chad in the back. Where did that second one come from? I mean, let's, let's, let's maybe rewind a little bit on that. There is nowhere that Ghostface can come from. And is he hiding behind the desk here? He certainly doesn't have time to come down these stairs to stab Chad in the back. But they're not expecting you to think about it. This kind of teleporting uh, masked killer 
that is a staple of the old kind of slasher that Scream is meant to be criticising, not just embodying the tropes of. Uh, Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, has some abominable, notorious teleports in it. Um, so for Scream to just do it uncritically and think he won't notice, is it lazy or is it just cynical? Is it just missing the point of Scream entirely? There was this gem in the commentary. Um, I will say on the last one, Ron was like, you guys don't need to shoot this car scene like this. And no, we were like, exactly. yes, we do. And then we finished it and we're like, didn't need to shoot the car scene like that. Why didn't we do that? Well, he was trying to get it out of the movie. And yeah. I was like, they can't teleport. They can't teleport. Well, apparently they can, guys. Maybe you just didn't give a damn. I don't know. Also, just while we're on this bodega scene, I just want you to notice a key point that Sam and Tara are stuck in here and cannot escape Ghostface because the back door is locked. I did tell you it was a key point. Keys, we need the keys! The second that this hide and seek routine bit of fun is over with, Ghostface is then able to just escape out of that locked door with no trouble whatsoever. And to me, this is just the filmmaker showing that they didn't expect you to notice, they didn't expect you to care, and they certainly didn't. This is a characteristic lack of attention to detail, and especially, I guess, lack of object permanence. They expect you to forget about things as soon as they're off the screen. They don't expect you to think about it. Weak. Weak and pathetic. And then I would also throw in the fact that they want to make a big deal out of Gail getting a ghost face call. Now, I get the feeling we were meant to get really hype over this, like it's essential, like, oh my gosh, it's the first time that she's ever had a ghost face call. But that's not the core of the series. It's not like we were just waiting around for that, like everyone has to tick it off their bucket list. In fact, I would even posit that Scream 6 really does a terrible overstatement of the importance of the calls from Ghostface, definitely in the opening. Now that might sound a little weird, but if you actually know the series very well, you can see that the call from Ghostface in the opening is not integral. Obviously, Scream is iconic in its opening, but Scream 2 never had a Ghostface phone call at the start. They did something wildly different and really good. Um, Scream, uh, sorry, Scream 3 started with a phone call, but it veered off from that quite wildly. It, uh, it used the phone call to instigate paranoia between Cotton Weary and his wife and have a very different kind of opening. It was an innovation. It wasn't tied down to the format. Scream 5, in rebooting the series, obviously, I'm quite forgiving that they needed to prove themselves by showing that they could do a good opening Ghostface phone call. So I let them off the hook with that one. And that also was kind of innovative. They didn't just do it rote. They varied it by having Tara survive. Now, Scream 6, again, I said it felt by the numbers. And uh, am I wrong? It feels like they just lean on the superficial signifiers of the Scream series without really understanding the heart of it of why that is there. And that is a major flaw in this. This is low-key my favorite moment in the movie, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Missed punch. And then... <laughs> I remember going, is this too much? But the Terra punches that were like, no, this is pretty cool. Yeah. This was an interesting moment when we were in, when we were in the sound mix. We were um, something about this wasn't working, and we were we were temping with with something that just ultimately didn't feel right musically and so we went and we got we got the the theme the gale goes around back i think is what it's called right from, from it's the, the theme movie. it's from the original from right the original yeah, yeah. Marco. that was the you know that was the little thing i think it, it what we realized is that callback is what was so what was so fun it grounds you firmly grounds in, screen, you in the screen yeah, like, universe in such a specific way the fact that ghostface teleports in order to stab chad for a shock surprise is awful not just because it's lazy, but because it's not Scream. Scream started with two killers partially to address this trope in horror movies, the teleporting trope. Jason Takes Manhattan is actually rife with teleporting. It's abominable with it. And so it's really shocking that Scream 6 would uncritically just use teleporting. The idea that you're wondering in a film, how can the killer just be in two places at once? 
Having that explained by the fact that there are two killers is an explanation so simple and so genius, you, you wonder why you never saw it before. That is a kind of ingenious innovation on horror that Scream is able to do when it's an in-genre critique. But Scream 6 just does teleporting lazily and uncritically. I can't teleport. I'll also throw in the fact that uh, similar to their problems of teleporting, there's also a big problem of object permanence in Scream 5 and 6. Uh, it's not something I'm going to make a big deal over, but particularly in the fight scenes, they are quite keen on having you forget what's happening in another room when it's out of shot. Um, you see this to an extent in Scream 5, you have two fights happening in two separate places that, revolt, that resolve differently, and really, the characters in the kitchen should come and help the characters in the hall, but they don't, they just sort of let their own fights uh, finish separately, so they all get their own neat little dramatic conclusion. You're not meant to remember that the other characters are still existing when they're in a different room. Scream 6 does this as well. Uh, in order to make the fight work, we won't dwell on it. It's not a big thing, but it is an annoyance. It's certainly not as bad as the dad charging and going arg. We're going to round this off now. I know this has been a long one. I have had so much to say. I've been recording so long, but there is so much wrong with Scream 6 that I hope you understand why I needed to do this. Friday the 13th part 6 was the instalment where they went meta, where they went self-aware and critical. And it's a bit of a delight for that. Elizabeth. Darren, we better turn around. Why? Because I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. <laughs> he think I'm a fart head. <laughs> yeah! Okay. Why'd I have to go and dig up Jason? Some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. And so it's an irony that for a series that talks about Friday the 13th so much, in Scream 6, they lost the meta, or the meta degraded incredibly. They try and say they're doing a twist, twist on a twist. Twist That just ends up meaning they did a predictable, repetitive sequel. Like an echo pedal, they're repeating themselves. They have sent the characters to uni, just like in Scream 2. They have done another Ghostface phone call opening. They have had a climax in a theatre. Do you need me to list it again? They are basically just regurgitating Scream 2. They have the cheap kind of wit, the easiest kind of irony that your uh, youngest teenagers can do. Basically sarcasm of, hey, wouldn't it be silly if I did the thing? And then they do the thing. For instance, the post credit scene. Not every movie needs a post credit scene. This is the easiest type of joke you can make, and it had already been done far better by Spider-Man Homecoming. It's effectively the same joke. Sometimes patience is the key to victory. Sometimes it leads to very little. However, it's not breaking the fourth wall, it's in character, and it's told a lot more subtly. They did not need to do it. This is the cheap wit of critique the thing and do the thing. And as I've shown, Scream 6 has been uncritically reproducing the tropes that it exists to comment on. Worse of all, Scream 6 is meant to be an in-genre critique talking about the biggest issues in the horror genre. Scream 5 took a bit of a fumble but did address something current in toxic fandom. They raised the issue of slashes being outdated and elevated horror being a thing. That was pretty good. Scream 6 goes back to a really old, extremely well-trodden territory of franchises, doesn't say much about it, and dodges the contentious issue they needed to talk about, which is the wokeification of movies. And they didn't talk about it because they were doing it. They were cowardly and slavishly repeating the big corporate message that Scream is not meant to be too afraid to comment on. Scream 3 was calling out Hollywood and the casting couch. That was bravery. That was Scream doing what it's meant to do. Scream 6, by dodging its main purpose, is less a sequel and more of a betrayal. It's not just disappointing, it's 
treachery, really. It doesn't belong in this franchise. They even are kind of aware of this in the commentary, uh, in the section where they effectively do a PSA on, uh, on safety at parties. Listen to this. This whole run, I sort of think we, I think we talked about, but it sort of stops being a Scream movie for about 15 minutes, which I love. Yeah. I would say it's more like the whole thing, but then from the commentary, we know that this is their attitude. We had all the, like, the logic questions, but it, none of it matters. It really shows. Guys, made another Scream movie. It Hard is. to believe. Scream that was it. That yeah. was it. That was, that was the show of Scream movie. No, no, it really wasn't. But anyway... That is everything I've got to say on Scream 6. I hope I covered it well. I know I was a bit scant on the coverage of Kirby, but this video is long enough. I feel you've got your money's worth. And uh, if you enjoyed it, which I hope you did if you got this far, please do subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And, you know, like. I mean, you got this far in this video, y you owe me a like. I think it's a point of honour. You want to be honourable, don't you? All right. It's YouTube, I have to shill, you expect it. If you like the stuff I do, if you want me to do more in-depth coverage, then uh, it helps if you support me uh, with the subscription and the likes, that's all good. But if you want to go a little further than that, you can leave a super thanks on the video, or even better, you can sign up as a member, supporting me either here on YouTube or even better on Subscribestar. All the links for everything you need for that are in the description. You, you know I had to say it. All right, that is everything from me on Scream 6, with a bonus bit of Agatha Christie, with a bonus bit of Agatha... Okay, that is everything from me on Scream 6, and a bonus bit of Agatha Christie history. Hope you liked it. Thanks, y'all. Cheers. Jesus Christ, you don't know the rules?